Hello, everyone, and welcome to Rob is a Podcast. I'm your host, Taryn Armstrong, and this is a very special podcast, a very special video or podcast, whichever one you want it to be. Uh, this is the story of Big Brother 25 from the live feeds. I'm your host again, Taryn Armstrong, and I'm about to take you on a journey through Big Brother 25 from the perspective of somebody who reported on the events of every single moment of the 100-day season every single morning. Now, to preface this, I, I want to point out that there's no definitive truth to events. I can only give you my perspective and my analysis as I condense the events of a 24-7 live feed into a couple hours of story. It goes without saying that we all come into any kind of subjective analysis like this with a whole host of biases. And I'm just one person doing my best to give my perspective. I will at times passionately present my viewpoint, but I will never stake a claim that mine is any better than anyone else's. Passionate critique of a player's game is not a condemnation or indication of how I feel about them as a person, just as praise of someone's game is not an endorsement of their behavior or actions in the house. So with that in mind, this is the story of Big Brother 25 and how the final three got to the end of the game. I feel like at the end of the day, this is a game. And everyone that is a house guest knows it's a game. So, you know, we're going to get blood on our hands. And, you know, I'm willing to do what it takes to, to go to the end. What I want to do is as much as I can, uh, you know, keep myself safe and have some close allies that I can take with me to the end too. It's not a lone wolf game that I'm going to play. I'm not going to make it to the end that way. So as much as I can, uh, be loyal to my closest allies. Um, but obviously there's going to be lying. There's going to be deception. Uh, there's going to be backdooring. All of that is natural for a game of Big Brother. And it's something that I've just come to terms with. In the pregame, before the game started, Jag came into the game the first sick Punjabi house guest. It's his dream to play on the show. He's a fan of the show. He's watched few seasons. He calls himself a secret genius and says that he wants to play as loyal as possible to his allies, though he understands that lying and backstabbing are part of the game and he has to come to terms with that. Now, there are two other players here that made, make the final three, and this isn't just gonna be about the final three. It will be about the season as a whole and how everything got to where it was. But of course, the final three went on a particularly arduous journey to get to where they are. And so uh, I am going to stop and highlight uh, their games as we move through the season. Um, and uh, and to do so, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull up the graphic to help you to help guide you along. Um, so. That was Jag. Bowie came into the game, also a fan of the show. She had watched, come from Australia, uh, and she had watched the show before. She had recently come into the US version of the show. Um, and she came into the game wanting to keep her age a secret, uh, saying that she was around 10 years younger than she actually is. And, and she also wanted to hide the fact that she was a lawyer. Now, her strategy was that she wanted to get into a big alliance. That was how she wanted to play the game. And then our third player here in the final three is Matt. Matt came into the game wanting to win early, and then lie low and avoid burning bridges in the game. And avoiding burning bridges is something that Matt did try to do quite a lot throughout the week, throughout the season. So here's how it went. Week one, the players entered the game. Uh, we had this week one, day one, night one competition that landed four people on the block, uh, Corey, Kirsten, Felicia, uh, and Jared. Um, but that wasn't super important immediately. Uh, there were some things that happened early on. There was an early alliance called the Phalanx Five with Luke, Riley, Kirsten, Matt, and Jared, but again, didn't really go anywhere. Just kind of a, a call out here uh, in the early portion of the season. Now. Jag bonds with Riley really early. And this is an important connection. Uh, night one, they're joking around, they're hanging out, they're having fun. Uh, and um, this connection, while it doesn't last very long in the game, is a very important one. Um, Matt, Jag, Luke, and Jared 
also bond very quickly in the beginning days of the season. Uh, they're the bros, the bros of the season. Yo, bro. <laughs> and they don't trust Corey. Uh, they think that Corey has some kind of power because Corey was dragged off to the nether regions, which is still a strange term for that. Um, I'm also going to apologize if my voice gives out at any point. Uh, we, we recently came back from a live show. Um, Jared quickly starts pushing Jag out of this group, uh, this bro group, um, because he prefers Luke and Matt. And he pitches to Luke and Matt that they should be a trio. Um, it's important to see that Jared has this very early connection to Matt. This connection is going to last all the way until Jared leaves the house, even basically for the second time. Um, whereas the connection to Jag as bros was always very fickle um, and never really held very strongly. So another big bonded group is the scary room. Uh, there are three bedrooms in the house, one of which was the scary room. And in that room was Riley, Blue, Cam, Jag, and Matt. And these five bonded over the fact that they were all in the same bedroom. Uh, this becomes very important as they are going to be the foundation for one of the early uh, alliances that takes uh, one of the sides of the house. Now, Kirsten, who is on the block, uh, is somebody who, again, she was involved in the Phalanx Five thing, um, and she's been talking to Sari and Felicia and Mimi about working with them. Um, and she's been talking to Jared. She feels like she's close to Jared. She has some doubts about Luke. She's not sure about this Luke character. Um, she doesn't, she doesn't think, she doesn't like him very much. Doesn't think that she, they should be working with him. Uh, now this is very early on and Jared thinks that Kirsten is being paranoid. She's doing too much too early. He lets Suri know about this Phalanx 5 business. Uh, Suri, of course, is Jared's mother. Uh, if you didn't know. Um, and they are hiding the fact that they are secretly mother and son. So Kirsten, who had been talking to Suri about working with her and then also working in this Phalanx 5 group, even though it was barely a thing, uh, confides in Jared about not really trusting the Phalanx 5, not really trusting Luke. And then Jared tells Suri that Kirsten is already doing a lot. Now, Suri is pretty disappointed because she was hoping that Kirsten was like really working with her, Felicia and Mimi. And so right away, Kirsten becomes a target. The other targets in the house at this point early in the season are Corey uh, for being dragged off to the nether region. And people are suspicious that he might have a power and he's having a little bit of trouble fitting in socially. Um, and then Cam, who also seems to be having trouble fitting in socially. Uh, people get some sketchy vibes from him. Uh, Izzy even says, that she gets serial killer vibes from Cam. Um, so he is another early target here in the uh, the first few days of the season. Now, Suri likes Bowie. Bowie, the Australian. Uh, she's chipper, she's chill, uh, and Suri thinks Bowie has a really good energy about her. Um, she expresses this to Jared, who says, mm, I don't like her. <laughs> but... Suri pulls Bowie into her, re her web regardless. She thinks that Bowie is a good number to have and starts talking with Bowie, wanting to work with Bowie. Um, Bowie is uh, in the comic room and, uh, and talking with them a lot. So uh, she makes this connection to Suri and through Suri, Felicia, uh, Izzy, and all of them in there. Um, now, Matt, on the other hand, uh, he's been busy. He's making bonds with a lot of people, again, He's made a really good bond with Jared immediately. Jared is talking about really liking Matt. Matt also bonds with Hysim. He's talked with Hysim a few times about the fact that he's deaf. Um, and Hysim has shared a story about how he once thought that he was going to lose his hearing because he temporarily lost it. They bond over that, and Hysim really likes Matt. Matt's only real concern in the first week is that Kirsten keeps bringing up the fact that uh, she was kind of like, interested in him but she thinks that there might be a thing with riley because she thinks riley's also interested in him um and kirsten keeps spreading around that there might be some guys alliance that might, might matt might be included in now nobody really believes this except for heisen but we'll get to that in just a second um cam and red 
are also going to bond early on over being very similar. Uh, they call themselves the Chill Billies, but Red doesn't really want to play too hard too early. So they're gonna they're not gonna do too much with that. Now Riley wins the first HOH, which isn't a real HOH. It's more of a safety HOH with a little bit of power because how this is going to work is that Riley is going to choose two of the four people that lost that first night competition and ended up on the block between Corey, Jared, Felicia, and Kirsten. Uh, she's going to choose two of them to be safe. Now, what most of the house wants is for Kirsten and Corey to be left on the block because those are two of the three big targets early on, Kirsten, Corey, and Cam. Um, and so that's that's what the, the push is going to be. But Kirsten is the primary target here. She's not only uh, angering the men of the house by talking about the men being in, a, in an alliance, but she's also angered a lot of the women in the house for uh, having been ratted out by Jared for double dealing and, and doing too much. So uh, Riley wins the HOH. Jag, who had bonded with her early on, celebrates with her. And they quickly make a final two, Jag and Riley together to the end. Um, Felicia gets in early with Riley to campaign for Kirsten to be the target and actually does some good work here with Riley, convinces Riley that that's the way to go. Of course, this is some self-preservation on Felicia's part because if Kirsten is the target, that means that she might be safe. Um, Jared feels very confident. He's on the block right now, but he's sure that Riley will save him. Not because he has a great relationship with Riley yet, but because he's very confident in Matt. He knows that he has Matt, and he knows that Matt will be able to get Riley to save him because Matt is really close to Riley. Now, this read is not like 100% solid, but it's important to note that he already has this much faith in Matt this early on in the game. He tries to get in on the ground floor of Riley's alliance, uh, Jared. Uh, he pitches that they should work with Matt and Luke as the core. Those are his guys, Matt and Luke. Uh, Matt, Luke, Riley, him. That would be a great core. Uh, now, the misread here from Jared is that at this point in the game, Riley's actually closer to Jag than Matt. And so she keeps bringing Jag up like, oh, but what about Jag? And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah Jag too, Jag too. But Matt, right? Matt. Um, now, Riley, of course, gets a little sketched out by how much of a package deal Jared, Matt, and Luke seem to be based on her conversation with Jared. He's really selling this idea that I've got Matt, I've got Luke. Don't worry about them. But she does still really like Matt, and she does want to work with Jared. So she's talking about forming this alliance. Um, in the meantime, Corey, who is concerned that he is about to repeat the fate of his survivor brother and be the first person voted out of the game, uh, he makes a hard pitch to Riley. He tells her about his brother. He tries to form a connection based on similar locations uh, that they are from or live in. And, <clears throat> and she manages or he manages to convince her to save him. Um, very good work here early on from Corey, saving himself in a move that wasn't super popular for Riley. Saving Corey is not what most of the house wanted her to do, but Corey does manage to convince her to do so. So Riley, Blue, and Jag come together. Jag and Riley are the final two, but they're also close to the people in the, in the scary room. Blue is one of those people. Riley has a good connection to Blue, and so the three of them come together and discuss what they want to do. And Jag suggests to them that they create not exactly what Jared wants them to, something a little different. Uh, he wants to create what we call in the audience an onion structured, onion layered alliance. Um, the idea of it being the core would be him and Riley. Then one layer out would be him, Riley, and Blue. And then another layer out would be him, Riley, Blue, and Cam and Matt. And that would be a five person thing. Um, and then one layer out from that, they build even more and add Corey, who had bonded with Riley, uh, America, who was fitting in with their group, and Jared, who was pressing to be involved. Uh, this would lead to an eight person alliance. The eight person alliance would be called Family Style. The five person alliance would be called The Handful. The three person alliance would be Crowd Control. And then, of course, Jag and Riley would be the true core 
of this group. Now, this is a great idea. Very interesting idea from a new player coming in like Jag to have such a sophisticated idea of how he wants to structure his alliances. It's very interesting. It's also very rigid. And in order to put something like this together, you need to have the finesse to do so in a way that doesn't make it fold in on itself. So unfortunately for Jag, Riley, and Blue, they didn't quite have that finesse. They very sloppily put this group together. And when they pull Corey and America into the alliance, it's very clear to them that they are at the bottom of the alliance. And they very quickly start discussing that with both each other and Jared and others pretty soon. So keep that in mind. Hysam has never been a fan of Corey. It's important to point that out. Um, and when he, because he has been a little bit skeptical of Corey, uh, the, the thing that really kicks it off is that Kirsten is, she's got some theories about the have not room. The have not room is Corey, Luke, Jared, and Matt. Uh, she thinks that those four might be in some kind of guys alliance. Now, this <clears throat> is a little sketchy to Heisen. Kirsten's not the most believable player in the house right now, but it does send him off onto like a side quest to discover the truth of this guy's alliance and, and really solidifies his, uh, his distrust for Corey. Keep that in mind because it's important later. Like many of these things, a lot of these early, early parts of the season, uh, they feel a little bit random and scattered, but they do come together in a nice way. Uh, so newly initiated into the majority alliance, America bonds with Jag over the fact that they're both fans of the show. Corey, who is in this new group as well, uses his position in the group to start spreading some anti Heisen propaganda. Uh, it's been made clear to him that Heisen is not his biggest fan. Every conversation with Heisen is Heisen, like, just stonewalling him. So he starts telling Family Style that Heisen is a problem, that Heisen is, is going to be, you know, coming after them probably at some point. Meanwhile, Heisen is not helping his case because he thinks that he's tight with Blue because they have an LGBTQ bond. Um, and he thinks that there's a good alliance that can that can be worked out with him and Blue. Uh, and and he wants to uh, to confide in her that he's suspicious that a big alliance might be forming. Um, and this is in part because of what Kirsten was saying, in part because he's genuinely catching on to something that might be happening. Uh, unfortunately for Heisem, he's telling Blue this information, and he thinks that Jag is at the center of this alliance, which is true. Again, the problem is that he's telling Blue this information. So he's telling Blue that he thinks that they need to form a counter group to, to fight this alliance. And so this one-two punch of Heisem trusting Blue with this information, who then, of course, runs it back to Jag in the start of her very similar game throughout the season, um, as well as Corey getting in there and planting seeds against Heisem. It's a, it's a pretty bad one-two punch for Heisem's early game with this group. Now, on the other side of the house, the bye-bye bitches are formed with Sari, Felicia, Izzy, Mimi, and Bowie. They've, they've kicked Kirsten to the curb uh, for being uh, too wild and out there and uh, running around too much. And they <clears throat> form this women's alliance, the bye-bye bitches. Uh, Bowie is involved because Sari likes Bowie, wanted to include her. A lot of the people are people who are sleeping in the comic room. Um, bedrooms usually form, usually are, are a big factor in these games. Uh, so Sari wants to pull in Heisem as well because she's bonded with him over the fact that they both work in the medical field. Um, and she also thinks that they can maybe pull in Red, who sleeps in the comic room. So this is before she even knows about family style. She's already bonded with uh, Riley and feels like she has a good connection there and that she might be safe with Riley. But she's already trying to form this, uh, this sort of like build out this group on the other side. That's when her secret son, Jared, comes and tells her about family style. Now, she was already, again, forming this group before Jared told her this information. There was already discontent with Corey, America, uh, and even Jared to some degree on the other side before he told Sari this information. But telling Sari this information really lights a fire under her, and she gets to work right away gathering the troops, pulling in Heisem, Red, and Jared into the existing Bye Bye Bitches group, 
to form their own onion structured alliance. This one being an eight person group with uh, called the professors. Now, you might notice an eight person group over here, an eight person group over here, family style, the professors. There's 17 house guests. Who's left out? Luke. Why? People don't like the guy. His stock is falling rapidly in the house as people think he's being fake. They think he's lying about his profession. He's just kind of a weirdo. Uh, and Riley decides that he's going to be her replacement nominee if the veto gets used on one of Felicia or, uh, or Kirsten. Now, Izzy, who we haven't been properly introduced to yet, Izzy knows about the Jared and Sari mother-son secret. She's been following Sari on Instagram. She's a big fan, but she has sworn herself to secrecy. But that means that she's been she's going to be working very closely with Sari and Jared throughout the season. Now, Izzy is a very active player and is going to be doing a lot throughout her time in the house. And this is our first real introduction to her. Uh, when she hears that Riley wants to put Luke on the block as the replacement nominee if the veto is used. She doesn't believe it. That's not the move. Why would she do that? Luke is ostensibly on the side of family style. This house is split into age groups for the most part, the youngs versus the olds, as Matt puts it. Um, so why would she intentionally get rid of a younger dude who fits in with all of the other younger people instead of going after any one of the other numbers. Certainly, this must be a lie, and Suri must be the real backdoor target, because why would nobody target Suri? For some reason, you don't know who Suri is. She is a survivor legend. Uh, she was included in this cast as the 17th house guest, and uh, she has a, an incredible track record in these games. She should be the number one target for every person on the board, which is why Izzy is so convinced there must be some sort of secret plan to take her out. So after Heisem wins the veto, Izzy questions Riley. Did you throw that? What's going on? You're certainly not putting up Luke. Um, and she starts spreading it around the house that Riley threw it. And this is all part of her plan to backdoor Sari. Jag lets, Izzy, lets uh, Riley know that Izzy is doing this. And this is the beginning of Izzy getting onto the radar for family style and in particular, Riley and Jag. So now on the radar of family style is Heisem and Izzy. So Corey uses the fact that both him and Jared were clearly brought into family style late to bond with Jared. He talks about how, hey, we are clearly the people who are the afterthoughts in this group. Uh, this is not a long-term group for us. We're, we'll have to explore options eventually. Of course, this is music to Jared's ears because he actually wants to work with his mother. Um, and so Corey and Jared really bond here. This is a very important relationship for the first half of the season. Jared lets Izzy and Sari know that Corey is open to open to working with, uh, you know, their group. And they begin to become more open to the idea of trying to pull Corey away from that group to come to theirs. And of course, Izzy being such an active player, she jumps on it immediately. She talks to Corey about wanting to work with Jared and Sari. Uh, Corey then also talks to Sari and they have a great conversation form this strategic connection that lasts for a little while. Um, and again, helps define this early portion of the season. Corey immediately again uses his position in this new grouping with Jared, Izzy and Sari to start pushing his anti Heisem agenda as well. He asks them to help him with Heisem because Heisem doesn't like him so much and, and starts sort of, you know, dropping seeds here and there about how Heisem is dangerous. Uh, Sari is a, a little more uh, hesitant to accept uh, it than like the the Riley group is at, at first, but uh, but she she's you know she's into the idea uh, about Heisen. So while this is all happening, Matt is using his connection with Heisen to convince Heisen that he's open to working with him. And he's not as attached to the group that Heisem sees him in as he thinks. Because again, Matt has been warned now by Blue that Heisem is concerned about a guy's thing. He's concerned about Jag and by proxy Matt. So Matt goes to Heisem and uh, similar to Corey is trying to explore options on the other side. 
Uh, Heisem runs that back to Cerise's side and says, hey, I think Matt is a trustworthy guy. I think Matt is somebody that we could pull in as well. Um, and of course, Heisem would much prefer Matt gets pulled in than somebody like Corey because he doesn't trust Corey at all. So, Red has now been inducted into the Professor's Alliance, despite not really wanting to talk much game early on. And so, he's been told uh, that, uh, you know, he's, he's been brought into this alliance. He goes and he talks to Riley. And before he even really knows about the other side, he already kind of, I mean, it's pretty obvious. <laughs> A lot of people know that there's some kind of grouping. He's talked to Heisem about it before. Um, and in talking to Riley, Red names a few people who are in Riley's alliance. And it freaks her out. How does he know? What's going on? I already know Heisem is concerned about a, a, an alliance. Um, Izzy's, I'm seeing Izzy talk to Luke. I'm seeing Izzy talk to other people. It feels like she's trying to recruit. Are they trying to recruit a counter alliance? Riley is very concerned. She brings these concerns to the handful, which includes Cam. This is our introduction to Cam proper here. Uh, he tells her, calm down. The other side, they don't know what they're doing. I know what to do. I am the key to all of this because Red named all of you, but not me. They don't know I'm in any of this and they trust me. So I'll get to work and win the day. Now, of course, Cam is very wrong. He's one of the people he, they trust the least, but this is Cam's perspective. He goes and he talks to Red and they share some information. The next day, Cam tells Riley, you need to stop associating with Matt. She cries. Like, what do you mean? He tells her, calm down. Listen, kid, you're a beautiful girl. Of course, they're going to assume you're going to hook up with the beautiful guy. Show them who I see. Show them you can separate from this God that I see in the mirror. And for the love of God, take a freaking breath and calm down. It was a little weird because nobody was really talking about Matt and Riley having a showman's apart from maybe Kirsten. Um, but nobody was really buying it at the time. Uh, and it gets a little weirder because he then goes to Izzy. And, I, and I'm talking about this because it's very relevant to the strategic direction of the game. He goes to Izzy and he says, I'm shaking because I finally revealed to Riley what our relationship dynamic was. And we cried together. And I told her, this is going to sound weird, but I don't view you that way. I had to be like, I just don't view you that way. She's terrified of being seen as in a showman's. Uh, and he goes on to spill about the other side working together and how, uh, you know, they're just a bunch of kids who got together and they don't know what they're doing. And Izzy is very excited. She's like, oh, look at this guy. He's, he's spilling everything. She gets him to agree to work with them, to split them up. He says, oh, oh, it's going to be so sad for me, though. You know, the Wizard of Oz is fake. There is no power. There is only rash decisions by a group of people that went on a first date and felt like they found the love of their life. Of course, this is very confusing to the professors, as it was to most of us. And Cam's defection convinces the professors that they should probably switch their target from Cam, from, from Jag, who was their target, to Riley, since Cam seemed so obsessed with her. Um, because Cam is trying, what he's trying to do is def defect, save himself, and ideally save Riley with him. But it's so see-through that it just paints a, ri a target on Riley's back uh, instead, of, instead of the one that had been on Jag's back. So, of course, Cam's insistence that Riley separate from Matt only really brings them closer, and they start hanging out more and more every night. He ends up telling Riley that he spilled everything. and that it was, it was for her protection. She cries to him, and she says she feels sick. Why would he do that? He says, you, you just need to chill out. You should be feeling better right now because of what I did. Now, what should you do? Chill. Mm. Good girl. Clever girl. Suri, of course, thinks Cam is out of his mind. 
Uh, and she does the rounds through the professors to make sure that nobody actually bought into his whole act. Um, when she talks to Heisem, he's not really concerned about Cam. He's more still dead set on Corey being the biggest problem outside of that main power structure. And this causes Sari to become skeptical of Heisen. This is really the turning point where she starts to agree with Corey that he might be a problem. She says so to Izzy. She thinks Heisen is a problem if he actually buys into anything this guy Cam is saying. So, Sari continues building out her own structure. The brown sugar babes form, uh, adding another cog into this whole uh, situation. Um, the brown sugar babes are Sari, Jared, Mimi, and Felicia. Um, now, Jared, like Heisem, uh, feels like Matt is somebody that he has a good relationship with, so he wants to make sure he keeps Matt safe on the other side, and he expresses that to the brown sugar babes. Blue lets Jag know that Heisem is still talking about this alliance on the other side. She doesn't know how he knows so much. Somebody must have leaked it. And this is the beginning of a saga that goes absolutely nowhere, but that will occasionally be brought up week after week. Somebody must have leaked our information. Who could it be? You think it might have been Jared? Let's think on it for some more weeks and then come back. Nothing ever comes of it. <clears throat> now, it's around this time <clears throat> when things get a little weird. I guess weirder. Luke, who is already been pretty firmly pushed to the outside edges of the house, gets expelled from the game for saying the N-word. Um, as far as I know, still unapologetic about it as well. So I guess good riddance. Um, the feeds go down until the rest, uh, until the end, until the weekends. Uh, and what we get on the eviction episode is that Kirsten is in fact evicted <clears throat> as we thought she would. She sure would be, I should say. Um, now, I do have this graphic. So um, it's just all of the different graphics I've used throughout the season. Some of them might skip ahead a little too far, but I'm going to move ahead here to this next one. Uh, eh, close enough. Just one more thing to point out here in week one is that Corey, uh, he starts his saga of uh, a another saga that kind of goes nowhere. Starts this saga of trying to work with Mimi. Starts on day four. They play chess together. He tries to form this secret strategic connection. It's very funny. Um, and, and again, goes absolutely nowhere. She never wanted to work with him. So that was week one. Big week one. We're already like a half hour in. S strap in, buckle in, because this is going to be <laughs> quite the journey. But what I want to do here is stop down and take a look at our final three. Because obviously we weren't talking a lot about them throughout the first week. And we won't be for the first few weeks of the game. But uh, let's just take a quick a quick look, a quick glance at, uh, at what they were up to. Bowie was given a five in the stock watch. If you don't know what the stock watch is, it's a podcast we do every week where we rate the players from one to ten based on how well we think they're doing in the game. Uh, Bowie got a five. Middle of the road. Average. She's popular in the comic room. She bonds with Sari. She gets included in the Bye Bye Bitches Alliance, expands into the Professor's Alliance. She's in a pretty good spot to make it far if that holds, but she has no real power in the game. And, you know, it's not like she's like super active and forging these pathways for herself. So uh, about average seemed right at the time. Jag, throughout the week, also gets a five. Now, Jag has the right idea with using the good fortune of a close ally winning the first HOH to build this onion alliance, but he executes it pretty terribly. <laughs> he includes people he can't trust, and he makes it blatantly obvious to the people on the outer layers that they're afterthoughts. It's pretty clear to me, especially, at least from my opinion, that while Jared being a mole, the secret son of Sari, did not help family style situation, the Bye Bye Bitches and Professors Alliance were already forming before Jared leaked anything. Additionally, the Heisem and Izzy versus Riley and Jag conflict already existed before Jared spilled anything. Corey was already planning to defect, and Cam spilled everything at the slightest provocation. So suffice to say, from my perspective, this alliance was doomed from the start, especially because if you look at the next results for the HOH, Heisem wins the week to HOH regardless. 
So even if Jared hadn't spilled anything, the tension between Heisim, Riley, and Jag would have been enough, likely, to lead to this same divide anyway. Now, again, the Jared leak does not help by any means, and it helped, uh, it did help the professors um, really dismantle this group, but, uh, you know, in terms of how this game shaped out, I don't think that Jared leaking was actually that huge of a shift. Still, Jack had a couple of solid allies, um, and he benefited from the fact that they were young and fit. Uh, he seemed to have a basic understanding of Big Brother strategy and all the tools that he should need to find some footing. He was friendly, charismatic, uh, and, and drew people to him. We were very optimistic about Jag as a player at this point, uh, and I was a big fan. Um, Matt also, boringly, gets a five this week. Now, his social game does shine immediately. He's not very involved strategically at this point, which is why he has the same uh, rating as Jag, despite being in a better social position. Um, but he is making a lot of relationships, including some crucial ones with Heisem and Jared, on top of the ones he creates with the Scary Room. Even as early as week one, a lot of people trust Matt way more than they should, especially for the amount of time that they've spent with him. On the other hand, his lack of strategic involvement did mean that he didn't have much of a path forward at this time, especially as a lot of the people he was closest to were flailing in the game. <laughs> so, <clears throat> that's kind of where we are in week one. Let's head into week two. Heisen wins the HOH. And at this point, I'll give you the slide. Um, Heisen wins the HOH. And Suri and Izzy are like, look at Jag panic. <laughs> look at him freak out. Uh, but Cam is just too much of a weirdo, too much of a wild card. We'll take Cam out before Jag. That We want Cam out, then Jag. They have a connection to Riley. They don't really want Riley out. Suri at least doesn't. Not at this point in the week. But Heisem thinks Riley is the biggest problem. Again, the Cam business. They had all been targeting Jag. Then it kind of shifted to Cam or Riley because Cam and Riley were this package deal now the way that Cam talked about her, like she was his daughter that also, like, had, didn't see her in a certain way. It was weird, and people were like, this needs to stop. So, they wanted one of them out, and Heisem thought Riley was the one that should leave. He's been told that she's been saying his name, which she has been, and he's been growing a little suspicious of Matt, now that he's seeing that Matt is connected to Riley. He was feeling good about Matt, but now he's concerned that Matt may really have some kind of relationship with Riley. So he talks to Bowie and Bowie pushes him to make a big move this week. Don't, don't chicken out. Go big. Go big. Don't go home. Or both. Jag, Matt, and the handful come up with a plan to get Corey and America on the block instead of any of them. And Obviously, that doesn't go anywhere. Heisem talks to both Jag and Matt, asking them both to not use the veto on Riley if they win it. They both promise that they won't, and they're both lying at this time. There's another twist happening with the nether region. Jared came in second place in the HOH competition, was brought to the nether, nether region. <clears throat> when he comes back, he chooses Jag to be removed from the house, making him safe for the week. This is to keep his cover in the Family Style Alliance. Um, and to keep Riley as an option to be targeted with Cam as the backup. Jag is confused about Jared's decision not to save Riley um, and how the other side knows so much about their plans and their structure, but again, it goes nowhere. Heisem lets Riley know that she's the target and, not, and he nominates her and Cam. You'll see that in the graphic here. Um, Suri comforts a shaken Riley, giving her advice on how to campaign and telling her that she should have the votes because her and Felicia will be with her. Uh, and at the time, she was telling the truth. She wanted Riley to stay and she wanted Cam to go. Jared and Blue start to solidify their relationship as he convinces her to drop Riley's group. They've been flirting and when he was gone, she said she missed him. Um, so he tells her, listen, this whole Jag situation, not good for any of you. So Blue talks to Jag about not using the veto if they win it. Because she's been convinced that maybe they should just let Riley go. 
and she even convinces Jag that it's the right thing to do. So the only person willing to use the veto on Riley now is Matt. With that in mind, Heisen doesn't think that Matt will use the veto, but he still needs to discuss what would happen if there needs to be a replacement nominee. If Cam comes down, he wants Corey to go up as a pawn. But if Riley comes down, he'll, he'll hate to have to do it, but Matt will have to go up as the target because they can't leave both Matt and Riley in the game together. And Heisen doesn't want Cam to go because Cam is a Hufflepuff. And I'm not joking. Now, his alliance did not feel the same way. They wanted Cam to go at this point. When Heisen talks to Matt, Matt again plays up that he's not included in any of the strategic conversations of the group he's in. And he convinces Heisen again that he's willing to turn away from his group and work with Heisen and the professors. And Heisen again is convinced. He doesn't want to put Matt up at all because he thinks Matt is somebody that they can work with. And so he switches his backup target to Hufflepuff Cam once again. Matt is safe through the social game. After Heisen wins the veto, there you go. Um, there's even more incentive to not put Matt up. A, the nominations don't have to change. B, there's some extra sympathy for Matt because he didn't have a chance to win the veto. It was not equitable for him uh, in that competition due to his deafness. Now, this is the peak of Heisem's Heisemisms. He starts talking about what they're going to do in a post-Riley world. He starts issuing orders to the Alliance. Uh, and at this point, Suri still wants Cam out. And it, it doesn't really care if it pisses Heisem off that they keep Riley. People are getting sick of the guy anyway. In the meantime, Jag has been trying to, he's stuck in week one. He's trying to rebuild his perfect structure. But every time he talks to somebody about an alliance, he can't help but bring up every single one of his allies. Most famously, he lays it all out to Suri, who becomes particularly annoyed at Jag and his gameplay. Uh, he's like, Suri, let's do something. It'll be me. It'll be you. And then, you know, Blue and Riley and, and Matt and, um, and maybe America. And, and she's just like, <laughs> I'm not just joining family style, bro. Suri, Izzy, Corey, and Jared continue to bond as a foursome. And they eventually form what is to be called the Crossroads Alliance. Now, this, of course, is a very important alliance. Again, defining the first half of the season. Corey continues to use his growing status in the house. And everyone's frustration with Heisem to push Heisem as a target as early as next week. Heisem starts talking to players on the other side, including America, who spills everything that Heisem said to her to Corey, who then relays it to Suri and company. Now, along with his own conversations with Heisem about various things, this fully solidifies the professor's turning on Heisem. Now, while this is happening, Heisem approaches Jag and Blue about an alliance that they agree to, but then he tells Suri and them about it. And so when they question Jag about the alliance, he crumbles. He says, ah, okay. His conclusion is that they need to keep working with Suri and Izzy because Heisem is a no-go. At this time, Corey mentions that Jag should be a better player than he is. Uh, he says this to the cameras. He thinks that Matt doesn't seem to have much going on and that Bowie, from his perspective, is not doing anything. So he approaches Bowie, and he says to her that he feels like him, her, and America are all kind of in a similar spot, and they should start working together. Another important bit there. The flip to save Riley comes to a halt, though, when Suri realizes that Cam is also anti Um, and doesn't come with the baggage of having the connections to Jag and Blue, people she doesn't really like. Um, Jag, though, still thinks he's behind the flip to keep Riley, and he's pushing hard on Felicia, telling her not to be scared to make the move. You gotta keep Riley. Make the bold play. And then they celebrate. Yes, we did it. We flipped Felicia. Mm, we got another vote for Riley. 
Meanwhile, Felicia had actually been convinced to flip in the other direction by Jag. She says, Jag is the one we should have been targeting all along. He should go right after Heisen. This guy is so <laughs> convinced he's good at this. But he's the one that's doing all the pushing. So in order to keep Jag and Riley in the dark, Sari and Corey, they keep passing the baton back and forth about the vote. Jag will go to Sari, who says, ah, oh, I just don't know if we have the votes because of Corey. And then Jag will go to Corey and be like, Corey, we need your vote. We've got Sari. And Corey will be like, ah, you think you have Sari, but I'm, I'm pretty sure we don't have the votes because of Sari. And then Jag will go back to Sari and he's like, no, Corey is definitely down. He's just worried about you. So if you tell him that you're good, then it'll be good. And she'll be like, I'll tell him I'm good, but Jack, I don't think he's on board. Uh, and Jack will go back and be like, Corey, you need to be on board. And they they refuse to get into a room together. And this goes around in circles uh, long enough that, uh, you know, there's never a, a solid conclusion. Now, Bowie continues to be a loyal soldier to the professor, so much so that uh, they don't trust her with this Heisem information because Bowie's such a loyal soldier, loyal player to the group, they're concerned that she's too loyal to Heisem. So they don't tell her about the Heisem stuff. And this means she ends up talking more with Red, who is the only other person who's been left out of this flip talk. And her discussions with Red only further isolate her from the group, because why is she talking so much to Red, the other person that they don't trust as much? A big part of her game at this point, she tells Red, that she wants to be seen as easygoing, but will fight tooth and nail to avoid being a pawn. Now, around this time, Corey makes a joke about the Middleman Alliance because of his conversations with Red, where Red talks about how he's playing the middle. So Corey jokes about how his favorite alliance in the house is the Middleman Alliance with him, Red, me, and Bowie. It's a joke. A joke that Sari takes very seriously. And it gets Mimi and Bowie in some really hot water for a while. Now, Matt confesses his feelings to Riley before she leaves, and then Riley is evicted. And that's week two. Now, throughout week two, Bowie wasn't a great week for her. She gets a four in the stock watch. Um, Bowie cares a lot about avoiding the block. She wants to be seen as non-threatening, but not so much so that she'll be used as a pawn, and she does work hard to maintain that balance. Bowie is an active participant in the professor's plotting, encouraging them to make big shots at the other side, being a loyal soldier in their group. She works on developing relationships with people within the Alliance, like Red, and a couple outside the Alliance, like Corey and America. However, her pace of game is just too slow, and she's too locked in and loyal to the group for the people she's playing with. The people she's playing with, <laughs> they, they're fast. They like, and not the way Red says it. They like to play fast. And they like to play a little dirty. And so she gets left out of most of the planning for the week. Additionally, her social game is starting to fall behind. In the first week, she was getting along with people pretty well. She was, you know, Australian. She had an accent. She was funny. But now... The second week, people are opening up more about their personal lives. They're solidifying their bonds, while Bowie continues to be a closed book, lying about her age, her profession, and it causes people to drift away from her. By this time, the middlemen, by, or by the time the middlemen alliance joke hits, she's in a prime position to suffer pretty heavily from it. And that's what happens. Jag, a five in the stock watch once again. He continues to show some pretty severe weaknesses this week as he, as he keeps trying to force this Onion Alliance structure after his initial one fell apart. And this is starting to become concerning. Is this guy a little too rigid for the game? He also loses his closest ally in Riley, and in the process, a target gets put on his back once again. Despite this, he does still have a loyal group around him. We're athletic and capable of winning competitions. And more importantly, Heisen messed up enough that he's jumped over Jag on the hit list, which should ideally give him more space to recover, maybe win some comps. Matt gets a six in the stock watch because while the, less, while the rest of his alliance is floundering, Matt has managed to stay completely clean, pulling off a great conversation with Heisem, keeping himself off the block while his almost showmance is being targeted, which is wild. He should have been on the block. He would have used the veto on Riley. It would have completely screwed over Heisem. Still, 
there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of direction to his game, and it's not clear at this point that these social bonds will be enough to carry him <clears throat> to a place where he's in a spot where he can win the game, especially with his allies flopping so hard. Moving on to week three, Felicia is going to win the HOH. Uh, and Crossroads, the Corey, Suri, uh, Jared, and Izzy Alliance, they're looking to push Hysom as the target. Um, this is what Corey has been wanting for a little while. Uh, the, the momentum got in there, and Felicia is 100% down to make that happen. Uh, she's also been pretty frustrated with what Heisman has been doing. Um, Bowie remains unaware of the Heisman target, but thinking that she's sort of nestled in her own onion alliance of women inside the professors, she does push for a man to be targeted this week to keep their numbers up. Um, and so this argument actually sways Suri, who pushes Felicia away from nominating Jag and Blue, and instead has her nominate Jag and Cam for the Heisman backdoor. Since Jag is next in line to be targeted after Heisem, he is the one that was guaranteed to go on the block as the backup target, as well as uh, the decoy target for Heisem. They're telling Heisem that Jag is the target. Um, so in order to make Jag feel more comfortable as the pawn and the fact that he's the backup target, uh, they finally agree to his pitch for this alliance he keeps trying to form. Uh, and this is what becomes the Seven Deadly Sins alliance. Um, now they're always clear about the fact that it's fake and that their true loyalties lie with Crossroads plus Felicia, but, uh, but they do create this alliance to keep Jag comfortable while he goes up on the block next to Cam as, uh, again, the decoy and backup nominee. Uh, so when Cam and Jag go up on the block, Cam, uh, Red, I should say, is, is a little confused. He's like, uh, we're in this professor's alliance. We're supposed to be, you know working together uh i thought we were like working with cam like what's going on here uh he was never told what the plan was so cam fills him in the plan is to take out heisen uh and red is upset that they didn't tell him about it but we also felt left out of the plan and she starts to feel paranoid about the group and she gets a little closer to red through this uh through this situation um, Corey and America also start getting a bit closer at this time, and they start officially working together in a strategic capacity. Uh, there's some flirting going on, but they're not quite there yet. Um, America, though, then starts getting in trouble for saying too much to people. She's been talking to Mimi, who rats her out to Suri and Izzy, uh, and uh, about Suri and Izzy, and then she also talks to Blue about Suri and Izzy, who goes to Jared, and this starts turning the house on her. Um, and they cite her participation in the uh, fabled middlemen alliance as proof that she's shady to people like Blue. Um, so not great for America. This is where things really start to go downhill. Uh, Jag ends up winning the veto. And uh, that means he gets to take himself off the block. And uh, Heisem is the intended replacement. Uh, Red admits that he threw the competition to him. Uh, that he felt like he could have won. He was ahead of Jag, but he threw the comp to Jag. Uh, Suri's side then starts playing what I affectionately referred to as replacement nominee roulette, as Izzy starts to be concerned about losing numbers if they get rid of Heisen. Bowie pitches to Felicia, why are we taking out Heisen? Why don't we take out America instead? And this actually catches fire. Um, Bowie's been pushing a lot this week, and it's been landing some. But Corey pushes back hard against this. He says that Heisem needs to go. He says the plan has progressed too far to change it now. And he eventually talks them down off of targeting America back to targeting Heisem. In the meantime, Red and Cam are discussing how to move forward now that they know that they're on the outs of the professors. Red says he wants to work harder to win the loyalty of the people in the alliance. But Cam wants to start building out their own group. Uh, so Corey having been told about the seven deadly sins forming, is getting concerned himself. He knows he needs to start to have some numbers as, of his own, and the fact that Suri and Jared and Izzy have their own separate thing, and he's locked in with them, and he has no other options, he starts talking to Red and Cam about working together on something. Red then reveals the professors to him, and they tell him, hey, we should work together, we should gather up a group, and you know who else would be great for this? Matt. Corey is shocked. He's like, what do you mean, Matt? 
You can't pull Matt in. He's working with Jag. Like, what are you what are you talking about? Don't talk to Matt about this. And they say, Corey, you don't understand. We have a special relationship with Matt. He will come with us. Corey says, please don't talk to Matt. You this is go this is a bad idea. And then in walks Matt. Corey books it out of the room. And lo and behold, Red and Cam tell Matt, you need to separate yourself from Jag and Blue. We can work on something. We can team up with Corey, America, and Bowie. We can build something new. And if you come with us, we'll bring you along. Dangerous information to be telling a guy who's aligned with Jag and Blue. But interestingly, Matt keeps this information mostly to himself. This was the first indication that Matt was actually playing intentionally and not just playing a good social game. Um, he does warn Jag not to trust Corey. Finding out that Corey is involved in Red and Cam's business is not good news for Matt. He wants to be the only one that's playing all sides. And now that he's hearing that Corey is doing it, he's like, all right, let me let me take some shots at Corey. He tells Jag, don't trust Corey, but he doesn't tell Jag anything else. Blue also warns Jag not to trust America. Why? Well, she just found out that Corey and America are in an alliance called the Middlemen. And she wants to work with Cam against Suri. America does. She's no good. They also learned, hear this, she was never voting to keep Riley. They were the holdouts. Tisk tisk. Corey, meanwhile, is focusing his attention on making sure that Jag stays as the next target uh, to help neutralize this new Seven Deadly Sins alliance. Uh, he wants Heisem to leave next, or this week, and then he wants to make sure that nobody move. Just because they form the Seven Deadly Sins alliance does not mean they should stop targeting Jag. Because if Jag leaves the Seven Deadly Sins that was created to placate him, it goes away. He doesn't have to worry about it. Fake alliances can become real. It's dangerous. Jag makes a last-minute attempt to change the target from Heisem to Red, thinking that this new Corey America Red Cam group is too dangerous. Um, but it doesn't really go anywhere. And Blue gets caught talking to Red and Cam, trying to cover herself. Felicia confronts Jag about it. She says, what is going on? And he clams up, which is a recurring theme. Um, he clams up. Matt comes to his rescue. Matt says, Corey is the snake. He's the one that's been running to Red and Cam. Jag is okay. Felicia is convinced. Matt does the damage control. And everything's fine. Uh, and while all this is happening, Heisem is napping at the dining table. Uh, it's a very funny series of events. Uh, check out the live feed update from that time because, oh boy, what a time. Heisem then is blindsided at the, uh, nom at the veto ceremony. And he starts spilling everything he knows about the professors. Jag has a moment of clarity where he's concerned, wait a minute, are we being played? If Suri has an alliance called the Professors and Suri has an alliance called the Seven Deadly Sins, what else does she have cooking up? She's the one at the center of everything, no? After Jag says this, Matt, because he says this to Matt, Matt and Jag talk about it together. They both talk about it. Jag forgets about it in a very frustrating fashion for me as a Jag fan at the time. Matt, though, starts working on his relationship with Suri. He starts talking to Suri more and uh, and getting in with her. Um, now, I, I'm not going to necessarily attribute intentionality here, but the timing is interesting that when they find out or start to suspect that Suri is running the game, that's exactly when Matt starts working on his relationship with Suri. He never vocalizes that this is his intention, that he's trying to cozy up to the person in power, but it feels like it probably was intentional, but I have no confirmation of that. So America finally realizes that she's been sold out by Blue. So she turns to Jag, telling him that Blue is locked in with Jared now. She found out that Blue has been ratting her out to Jared. And they need to figure something out because the other side is really strong. 
Uh, Jag, at this point, though, doesn't trust her. All this information that's come out, he doesn't believe her. He doesn't think that she's uh, trustworthy. Um, and so uh, so Jag, uh, he, he says, well, listen, what happened with that Riley vote? What happened really with that Riley? Were you ever really on board with the Riley vote? Uh, and, and America's like, what, what do you mean? <laughs> Who cares? Uh, he just doesn't believe America. Corey tries to warn America, don't trust Jag, but she insists we have to work with him. He reluctantly agrees, and so they start hanging out. Matt, or sorry, uh, Corey, America, and Jag. And they call themselves the Unreliables. Classic. Uh, Red and Cam bring Matt in as their official third. They kick Corey out. They want Matt. And they discuss some long-term plans. Matt helps poison the well when it comes to America for them, telling them they can't trust her. They shouldn't really talk to, to Corey as much either. Matt is just getting in there with Red and Cam and stealing Corey's spot. Uh Red decides he'd rather try to reform the professors uh, with Matt in it than try to build Cam's new thing. And so he gets them all together to form Legend 25. Uh, and this is... <coughs> Sorry. This is uh, Suri, Izzy, uh, Matt, Cam, Red, uh, you know, uh, Felicia. It's a new, a new big group of people. Who, uh, it's a, just another another segment of the game that is, uh, you know, that uh, that Suri is in control of now. So, Matt discusses this with Suri. He's in Seven Deadly Sins. He's in Legend Twenty Five. Hey, Suri, we're in, we're in a couple of alliances together. Look at us. Uh, and they talk about how uh, they're happy to play both alliances off one another. All of a sudden, Matt has found himself in in a kind of a power position, or at least a very safe position of some power. <laughs> uh, Suri and Izzy start to discuss how to move forward with these two alliances. Red and Cam are threatening to them, but so are Jag and Blue. They feel very good about Matt, but what they want to do is get Red and Cam to target Jag and Blue, and Jag and Blue to target Red and Cam so that their threats take each other out, which is exactly what they start to do. They also talk about not trusting Bowie anymore. She has nowhere to go if Red and Cam leave, so eh, they can include her in their end game, but they just don't trust her. They say Jag is definitely the first of the seven to go, but Cam is also a threat and he also needs to go. Corey, he's also become dangerous with this America connection. They decide they'd rather have Bowie in their end game than Corey, given that he's connected to America now and America's causing all kinds of trouble. So, there's another attempt at flipping the vote. Why? Well, Izzy and Sari become worried that Cam and Red are secretly working with Jag and Blue, which is what they should be doing. Uh, but they're not. Corey has to work really hard to shut this down, arguing that it's so far along in the process and that keeping Heisen pisses more people off at this point. So as a way to lock in the vote and feel better about, and, and make them feel better about America, they form the For Real, For Real Alliance. It's considered to be the most real alliance at the time, hence the name. Uh, and it includes most of the people that Suri and, and Izzy want to work with. Um, so Bowie, though, thinking that she's locked into a new Legend 25 alliance, settles down and just starts working on her relationships again. She makes a final two with Felicia. She's like, all right, back on the ride. <laughs> Yeah, she's going to find out soon that that's not quite the case. Corey starts realizing as he's talking to people, he's talking to Jared. He talked to Cam and Red and they were like, Matt is our guy. He said, no, he's not. And they were like, no, you don't understand, Corey. He is. He talks to Suri. Suri's like, I got Matt. He talks to Jack. Jack is like, I got Matt. He talks to Jared and Izzy. And Jared says, I've got Matt. And Corey starts to wait, hold on. Everyone thinks they've got this guy. What is happening? He says, Jared, I'm worried about Matt. This guy's becoming dangerous. Everyone seems to trust him. And Jared says, ah, well, that's the thing. This is perfect for us because he's 
actually loyal to me. And Corey's like, dude, no, that's the problem. Everyone keeps saying that to me, but you can't all be right. And Jared's like, yes, because I'm the one that's right. I've got him. Corey's like, you don't get it. That's what I'm saying. Everyone feels that way. Jared's like, yeah, and they are wrong. Corey can't break through. He gives up and just starts having conversations with Matt. He just starts trying to bond with Matt. He's like, if I can't beat this guy, I, I just got to join him socially. Now, there's another last minute attempt at a flip that Corey shuts down with the help of Izzy. And after he shuts the flip down, he lets his guard down around Izzy because he felt like she was a team on a team with him to shut this flip down. And they talk end game plans. Uh, which she, of course, quickly rats out to Sari, causing them to lose a lot of trust in Corey. They were already concerned about his connection to America, and now they know that he's plotting an endgame that isn't quite ideal for them. So, Heisem is evicted, and uh, we head into to the next week. That is, uh, that is the series of events here. Um, so, let's let's stop down a little bit. The week for Bowie was not great. Um, her passive play really starts hurting her here. She gets a three in the stock watch. The problem is that she keeps getting pushed out of things. And even though she found out she wasn't in the core anymore, she happily believed in this new, very obviously fake Legend 25 alliance and thought that it was going to work out this time. Her lack of involvement in the game has been damaging her image as well as a respectable game player. This is a low point for Bowie in the early game. She's starting to be seen as a non-entity, and it's it's hard to crawl your way out of that uh, image. Jag, he's a four in the stock watch this week. Starts to lower down a little bit. Uh, he enters this week as, as a backup target, and if Heisem had been picked to play and won that veto, Jag's gone. No path to power yet. Uh, but he wins the veto. Um, and he definitely needed to, because even if uh, even if Heisem hadn't won the veto, it was so close to flipping that vote so many times. Uh, we can definitely say this is the first of many weeks where his veto win was, was fairly necessary for his survival. Um, his push for the Seven Deadly Sins Alliance should be a point in his favor, but all it really does is, is lull him into a false sense of security, which, of course, is exactly what the intention behind its creation was. Uh, this is also the week where we start to worry that he's not going to improve as a player in, in the way that we've hoped. Uh, he's given a ton of information from uh, both Heisem and America, uh, and, and, and he chooses to basically ignore all of it while being pushed onto the front lines of a battle between him and Blue uh, and, and, and Red and Camp for no particular reason. He's just like happily like, oh, I'll take marching orders from Suri. Yes, I will go against Red and Cam. Why? There was never any beef between the two. It was all fabricated by Suri and and her and her allies, and he just allowed it to happen while being warned by Heisem in America and other people who were like, "Dude, you're being pushed onto the front lines." And he was like, "What do you mean? The whole game is a front line, no?" <laughs> Additionally, Matt has recognized at this point that Jag's position is pretty dire. And he's not really willing to stick his neck out too far to help him. Uh, he's not warning Jag about some of the information that he's getting. So it feels like Jag's time in the house is pretty limited moving forward. That's what it feels like to us watching the game at this time. Matt. He's a six this week in the stock watch. And this is the week where Matt's social game starts translating into strategic positioning. His connection to Red and Cam allows him to get in on the ground floor of their plans, despite Corey warning him. Warning them that he's not to be trusted. Dude, don't trust Matt. They were like, we hear you. But we do trust Matt. Let's actually push Corey, uh, Corey out. <laughs> he's able to use the information he gathers from Red and Cam to benefit himself by bringing some of it to Suri, recognizing that she's in a position of power and fostering her distrust of Red and Cam while working on sabotaging Corey's attempts at building his own army. 
By the end of the week, Matt has nearly managed to replace Corey in the pecking order entirely, and soon that transition will be complete. Uh, it's good work by Matt, and it's the first sign we're seeing that he is a strategic as well as a social player. So, we head into week four, where Cam wins the HOH. Uh, it's the pressure cooker. And when Cam won, Red noticed that Izzy looked upset when, when he won, uh, which concerns Cam. You know, he had been placated by this Legend 25 alliance, but like if Izzy is concerned, like what's going on? Because of this, he considers an Izzy backdoor, but for now, the obvious move is Jag and Blue on the block. So, so that's what happens. Um, Jag, despite having a ton of information on Izzy and Sari that would instantly stop Cam from putting him on the block, says nothing in his defense when Cam tells him he's going up. I mean, when Cam won, everyone was like, here we go. He's going to target Jag. But Suri and them have been so sloppy. Jag has so much information on them. Surely, in order to prevent himself from being targeted by Cam, a recent ally of his, he will just say, hey, don't you think there are bigger fish to fry than me? Don't you think there are people that are playing off of each other? He knows that Jag, or sorry, he knows that Cam and Red are in their own fake alliance with Suri. He knows he's in an alliance with Suri. He's been warned by Hysim, by America, that Suri is playing all sides. He says not a word of this to Cam when he tells him he's going up on the block. We were dumbfounded. What are you doing? Do you want to be here? Not only that, but Jag then says, you know who I really want playing in the veto for me? Izzy. Meanwhile, Izzy and Sari agree that their goal for the week should be to take Jag out. It's finally time. America tries to warn Jag again that he's being played. He needs to start doing something if he wants to stay this week. At the very least, please don't pick Izzy to play in the veto. Corey tries to get her to stop. He tells her, listen, you have to stop telling Jag things. He's in this alliance called the Seven Deadly Sins. He thinks he's with them and he's been lying to you. She's, wow. Screw him then. Corey says, I mean, I, I would prefer for Jag to stay at this point because now that Suri's group is targeting him, like he's become a problem for them. So it'd be good if Jag won the veto and saved himself and then, you know, they'd have to deal with him. It gives Corey more time. While this is happening, Cam in the HOH room is debating with Red about the Izzy move. He still thinks maybe they should backdoor Izzy, but he eventually backs off. He doesn't want to lose Sari, who he's come to trust via Red. He does, however, want to revisit the idea of creating an alliance uh, of himself, Red, Bowie, Corey, America, uh, and Matt. Uh, they still feel like they have Matt, and they felt connected to Bowie ever since they were the ones left out of the Heisen plan. Um, and Corey and America have been working on their relationship with Cam again, so he's feeling like, maybe we can bring them back in, but uh, he's not sure. Blue tells Jared at this time, not sure entirely where it came from, she'll be really upset if America makes it further than her in the game, and I bring this up because it becomes important later. So they play the veto competition, and Red wins the power of veto. Cam considers again having him use it to take the shot on Izzy, but... Again, they decide against it. Uh, they trust Suri, Bowie, uh, and Matt, and they don't want to blow up their alliance. Those are the people they trust the most, Suri, Bowie, and Matt. They don't want to piss off Suri. They don't want to They don't want to blow up, you know, Bowie's in the alliance. They don't want to blow it up. But when I tell you how close Cam is to wanting to do this, to how close he is to doing this, Jag could have said a single word. and And he could have saved himself. And America kind of knows this. She's really upset that Jag lost the veto. She pleads with him to campaign to Cam and Red to try to get them to target somebody else. Jag says he will. And he tells Blue that they need to talk to Sari to get her help to make them, uh, to help them make a pitch. And Sari, of course, immediately shuts this all down and no pitch is made. And she ensures that Jag is the one that's going to go home. America, again, tries to warn Jag. She tries to let him know that his alliance is not working with him. She says, Jag, they're not with you. 
and she names every person in the alliance. She doesn't say the name of it, but she basically says, I know that you think you're working with them, and here are the people that you think you're working with, but they are not working with you. But he still doesn't believe her. He rats it out to Izzy. He says, Izzy, how does America know about our alliance? Uh-oh. Izzy goes straight to Corey. What the hell is going on, Corey? How does America know about the seven deadly sins? Corey has to do damage control. Uh, he says, I, I, I don't know. I think she's just guessing. He tries to play it off, but it's another point against Corey in the crossroads and the, in the Suri structure. Um, and this pisses Corey off. He stops trying to keep Jag. He actively wants him gone again. He's like, this guy has, there's no hope for him. He's got to go. Jag also talks to Matt uh, about America, and this is when uh, Matt calls her a dumb f um, That same night, Matt stays up with Corey in America, and they make a loose alliance that they name the Reliable Rats. You know, don't say Matt's not good at BSing. So Bowie has reached her limit with Izzy making her feel unwelcome, making comments about her all the time, and she cries to Suri about it. When Izzy learns about this, it only deepens her distaste for Bowie. How dare she? How dare she be the one that's uncomfortable around me when she's the one doing it? It's at this point that Corey starts to put even more work into Bowie, not really understanding why everyone seems to be turning on her and seeing it as an opportunity to solidify a number. At the same time, Bowie is reluctantly getting closer to Red and Cam, who are Two of the only other people bothering to include her in anything nowadays. Corey and America also officially become a showman's at this time. And Jared and Blue clean up. And he tells her about his mom. Never really goes anywhere, but yeah, I feel like I got to point it out. Matt makes a hard pitch to Izzy, Suri, and Felicia to keep Jag. He says, listen, I know you want Jag out, but if we want to fight Cam and Red, we need competitors, and Jag is a better competitor. If we keep Jag, that war continues, and we have a better shot of getting rid of Cam. This argument lands. Matt succeeds, and after they talk to Matt, they say, maybe we should keep Jag. They discuss votes. Well, Jag no longer has Corey in America, so we need to get Jared on board. This kind of has an added benefit, too, because it allows Jared and Matt to maintain their cover with Cam and Red if they blame their votes on Corey and America. It's a complicated plan. It's not really that necessary to understand it. But the point is that obviously Corey and America are votes against Jag at this point. And so they want to blame votes on Corey and America. Uh, and they need Jared to agree. The point is they need Jared to agree to this plan to keep Jag and get rid of Blue. Right after they, you know, got together and he told her about his mom. So he pitches the plan to Jared. He shuts it down. He says he wants Jag out, and it's important for their game that Blue stays. He lets her know, hey, also, Felicia has gotten annoyed at all this flip-flopping, and she told me that she wants a final two with me. This forever damages Suri and Felicia's relationship. She's annoyed about Felicia turning on her, saying that she's talking too much. Um, they never fully recover from this. It's, again, important to point out. She's also annoyed at Jared. She really wants this to happen. And she, I, I think, is uh, she's at this time feeling like Blue is, is uh, a negative influence on her son uh, in terms of the game at the very least. And uh, But ultimately, she has to reluctantly agree to kill the flip. It becomes clear that Corey also wants Jag out. So if Jared is not on board and Corey is not on board, then they don't even have the numbers anyway. Izzy says, the, 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 this guy can't even tell me what his plans are after Red and Cam leave J Jag. He's too sketchy. Good riddance. Um, Jag not doing a great job of, of campaigning for himself. Um, while this is happening, Red has become increasingly concerned about America's flirtatious nature and thinks Cam, worried, he's worried that Cam might get sucked in. So, uh, you know, he starts talking about that. Cam, meanwhile, has changed his tune on Corey now that America Corey has become a thing. You know, again, I don't want to necessarily lock in that this was intentional, 
But coincidentally, at the same time that AmeriCorps became a showmance, Cam officially was out on America and Corey as people and allies. He no longer wants that separate group, and he thinks that Corey needs to go soon. Red is like, no, America is the problem. Cam says, no, America is just the fancy car. Corey is the engine. So around this time, the Corey's relationship with Jared also starts falling apart as they get into a little scuffle about whether Corey has the kind of personality necessary to be a fan favorite. Why are they talking about fan favorites? Because of Path to Power. This was the twist where they voted for the top four house guests to, uh, uh, po most popular house guests to compete to get the power to reverse an eviction. Um, the four people voted in were Corey, Matt, Suri, and Jack. Matt lets Suri know that he was in the top four for Path to Power, and she tells him that she was as well. She lies to most other people about it. Um, the rest of these conversations are blocked in the feeds, but we do learn that Matt won Path to Power eventually. Um, Corey, in the meantime, is still noticing that Matt has continued to weasel his way into the power structure, and he tries again to convince Izzy and Jared that Matt cannot be trusted. Everyone trusts him. Everyone believes in him. He made a final three with me in America. The guy is dangerous. And Jared and Izzy don't hear it. They say, no, Matt's loyal. We're telling you, you gotta, you gotta chill on Matt, dude. Matt, uh, Jag, in the meantime, still has not been told that he's getting voted out. America tries telling him that Sari isn't on his side and that he doesn't have the votes, but he doesn't believe her. Again, Jag, she says, you can't trust them. He says, no, they're with me. I'm telling you. She says, this is the same sh they did to Riley, Jag. You have to see it. He says, no, it's different than Riley, though. We'll, we'll get in. We'll go, I'll get into a room and I'll agree. Jag, no, no. I'm telling you. Jag, they're lying to you. They're not. I trust them. Stop sketching me out, America. I'm the one telling you the truth. America, you need to understand that they are down. Even Red is thinking about it. J Jag, no, Jag. Red thinks he's working with them. But that's fake. Jag, it doesn't matter. He thinks he's with them. Please just trust it, America. She loses it. Jag eventually gets Suri into a room with Corey and America, gets them all into a room, and they all half-heartedly agree to keep him. But the second he leaves, they agree he's got to go. So Jag is evicted unanimously. Prior to the eviction, he is told by Matt and Suri that he'll be okay no matter what. Jared also tries to tell him he'll be all right, but Jared wasn't supposed to know. So Jag questions Suri, who denies Jared's involvement. Suri then scolds Jared, who goes back to Jag and scolds him for going to Suri which is a pretty obvious tell that something nefarious is going on here between Suri and Jared. But don't worry, Detective Jag is on the case a month from now. Matt saves Jag from being evicted, and that was week four. So in summary here, Bowie... She gets a three in the stock watch. Things are not looking great for Bowie. She's still struggling with social connections. She's been fully pushed out of Suri's crew by now, but she thinks it's Izzy's fault. She doesn't see that Suri is, is, is part of it. Meanwhile, she's working on other bonds, trying to get involved in the game again, strategizing with Red and Cam and having long talks with Corey. Overall, her path is still pretty non-existent and she's struggling to find purchase in the game. So not looking great. Jag is a two in the stock watch. He got evicted, and it was his fault. He got three ones from the panel. He got lucky with a three from the audience. It was an abysmal week of gameplay by Jag, one of the worst I've ever seen. He allowed himself to be thrown into the front lines of a war against Cam and Red, and then happily went down with the ship, a, a ship that was never real. He had so many opportunities to save himself and change the course of the game, but blindly believed in a fake alliance despite multiple warnings from multiple people and, and, and pieces of information from all kinds of different sources. It was, it was incredible that this happened, that, that it, he just laid down and let this happen. Not only did he not believe any of the warnings, but he openly ratted out the only people trying to help him, turning them against him and ruining any chance he had at organically being saved via the vote. His game this week was the definition of a one with only himself to blame, if not for out of the ordinary luck with the twist coming into play and Matt getting it as the only person that would have been willing to save him, he's a well-deserved 13th place this season.
Matt, on the other hand, got a six in the stock watch. He displayed, again, some adept social maneuvering this week. Despite his closest allies being targeted, like the Riley week, by any measure, Matt should be on the block right next to Jag. But his social and strategic position made that not even close to an option, with Cam and Red believing he was in their inner circle. He continued to actively work against Corey and America while usurping their position in the game, gaining the trust of Suri, Jared, and Izzy over them, and making sure that Cam and Red still trusted him over them as well. His position was so solid that Corey calling it out directly had zero impact on it. He also then started working on his relationships with Corey and America with pretty good results. His campaign to keep Jag was very effective and was ruined mostly by Jag's own efforts, uh, and he never got any heat for this attempt. He then is able to seemingly convince Suri to allow him to save Jag with no negative repercussions on his own game, despite it being pretty terrible for hers. Now, it's impossible to know exactly how that went down, at least now, because we didn't see those conversations. But the fact that he was allowed to do it and he got no pushback uh, afterward was, was weird. At this point, Matt is well positioned with every faction of the house. The biggest fault in his game here is that, like everyone else, he's still running into a brick wall when it comes to Suri and Jared's endgame. So... Where does he go from here is the question. He's very safe, but can he actually get around the barrier that is Suri? We'll find out. So we head into week five, where Jared wins the HOH. Uh, it's a knockout competition. And uh, Jared, of course, wants to target Cam. Um, he would like to put America next to Cam, but he does recognize that it's smarter to put up Red instead. Uh, his plan is to turn them against each other and tell each of them that the other is the target. And this works very well. Uh, almost too well, in fact. Uh, Matt quickly tells Jared about having the power. And Jared, of course, already knew from Suri, but, uh, but this makes Jared feel like he's right in trusting Matt that he told him about the power. Their bond deepens even further. Um, Jag, on the other hand, he just got voted out. And he's a little concerned because of that whole debacle with the back and forth about who knew what about the power. And the fact that he was voted out in the first place is uh, a little concerning. A little concerning for Jag. Um, so he questions Suri about it. Why did he need to be saved by a power? She blames it all on Corey and America. He goes to Corey and America. They blame it all on Suri. Jag says he just wants to hear both sides out. Corey says, dude, what do you think is more likely? Like, who do you think is more likely to be driving the decisions in the game right now? Because it's it should be pretty clear that it's not me and America. Jag tells Matt, listen, we need to be careful around Suri because Jared knew about the power before Matt told him anything, before you told him anything about it. And they were clearly communicating about it when I was going back and forth with them. So he's leaning toward believing Corey and America more, but he, he still needs to investigate, you know, just in case. So he questions Izzy about it. Of course, warns Suri that he's still trying to investigate. And Suri, Suri is annoyed. Suri's like, this guy has got to go. <laughs> he's asking too many questions. But in the meantime, she makes a final three with him, of course, uh, at Matt's prompting that they loosely name Riley's promise because Riley told Matt the lookout for Jag and Suri. Suri managed to keep Riley uh, feeling so good all, all the way until she left. Um, in the meantime, Matt continues his anti corey in America propaganda, and he pitches to Jared that America should be the backup target. Cam comes off the block, and, and Jared agrees. He's down for it. He wants to target America if Cam comes off the block. The pitch works for Matt to get America on the block, which is a huge pressure point on Suri's structure that uh, that Jared has been sort of pushed into this. And, and Matt is a huge cause of that. Matt has been poisoning the well on America consistently. Um, and at the time, it felt like he was putting too much pressure on this. It was being too uh, aggressive. But uh, in hindsight, it, it did put a lot of pressure on the structure that existed because Jared getting uh, increasingly annoyed at America, pushed Corey further and further away, and then eventually led to what it led to. So 
The next morning, Jared gets into an argument with Corey about America being the target if he feels like she doesn't try in the veto competition coming up. Uh, and it's this whole big blow up that, of course, uh, you remember if you watched the feeds. But um, it really puts a lot of pressure on their relationship that was already starting to dwindle a little bit. Um, so then, of course, uh, with Cameron and Red on the block, Cam wins the veto. Um, Corey pushes hard to make sure that America does not go up as the replacement nominee now that Cam has won the veto because that was Jared's plan straight up. He reveals, in an attempt to make sure that America doesn't go up, he reveals that his uh, brother is Zach from Survivor to Izzy, Jared, and Suri. Um, and uh, America makes a strong campaign to Jared, telling him she's not throwing competitions, she's not coming for Suri and Izzy. Jared is skeptical of that because of the questions he's been getting in the diary room, but him and Suri do start to lean more toward targeting Jag as the backup target uh, because he won't drop this investigation from last week. And he they, they got really weirded out by his hours-long strategy talk with Red in the kitchen the night before, um, which uh, I, I did uh, forget to mention just a second ago. Jag spent hours talking to Red about strategy in the kitchen, pitching that they should work together in front of everyone. It was the sketchiest thing in the world, and it's part of what got Sari back on board to targeting Jag. It's what got Jared back on board to targeting Jag, as well as his continued investigation into the vote out when he should have just known. Dude, pretty obvious. The frustration is coming back to me. Um, Jared tells Blue he's going to have to maybe target Jag because he's a liar. He knew about the power. And he didn't tell you. Blue agrees. And it flips to Jag. Suri approaches Matt about targeting Jag, but he still he says it should still be America. Um, he's not able to make that case, though. This, the case against Jag is too strong. Matt is unable to protect Jag in this instance. Uh, in fact, the fact that Matt wants Jag to stay makes Suri want to target him even more. Um, Corey, even at this point, wants Jag to stay again because Red is too much of a Suri soldier. He thinks that it's a mistake for Suri to send out uh, to send out Red, and he wants to allow her to make that mistake. He argues with Jag about it, but again, with no success, and the fact that there's more pushback for Jag to go up in the first place means that there's more reason to send Jag out. Meanwhile, the Chillbillies, they break up. The plan that Jared used to split them up by telling Red that Cam threw him under the bus, it worked too well, and now they have a dramatic breakup at the hot tub. I highly suggest checking out the live feed update uh, from that day if you want a full reenactment of said breakup, but it is not particularly relevant to our current story. So uh, the point is that Red and Cam have a dramatic falling out, um, which is important. With everyone locked in on Jag being the target, Blue volunteers him for the block during a Seven Deadly Sins meeting. Um, and Jag reluctantly agrees to going up as a pawn against Red. But in reality, he is the target. Um, and Jag goes up on the block as the replacement for Cam. So, this is around the time that Matt quotes Andrew Tate to Jag. Wondering if it's an Andrew Tate quote or a Dan Blazarian quote. Uh, I had to Google who that was. I don't recommend it. Um, it's not particularly relevant to the game, but it provides some context for how some of the fans started to feel about Matt from this point forward. And I think does inform the way that Matt uh, seems to look at and talk about the women in the game. Um, and, uh, you know, you can sort of read into how that influences his gameplay, uh, as you will. Um, Jag continues to be the target until Red starts questioning Jared about what it was exactly that Cam said and did to him. Jared flounders a bit here, uh, in that conversation, and Red talks to Bowie about wanting to get to the bottom of it, to see if there's anything that, that he can do to rekindle the relationship. Jared lets Izzy and Sari know about this, and they start to reconsider the vote at the last minute. Sari knows that Red will be loyal to her, but if he figures out that Jared lied to him about Cam and he gets upset at Jared for breaking up his relationship with Cam, that puts Jared in danger. And so 
she has to flip the vote to protect Jared. He was too sloppy in how he handled Cam and Red, and now she has to give up one of her best soldiers in order to protect her son. So with Jag staying, Corey starts thinking, okay, perfect. But I had nothing to do with it. He's feeling left out. So he's thinking about whether or not they should dump all of their information about Sari on Jag to get him to flip and target Sari if he wins HOH. They're worried he won't hear it, though, uh, because he was so open to working with them at the start of the week, and then he got drawn back in by them again. And so they feel like they can't trust him. They can't, they can't continue to bring him information. He's just such a bad player, they say. Through all of this, Bowie has been trying to get back in with the bye-bye bitches, which has only frustrated them because she keeps talk-blocking their conversations. Jag and Matt play some pranks on Mimi late in, on Wednesday night. Uh, and she wakes up the following morning wanting to flip the votes on Jack. She thinks that him and Matt are too close, and they're too comfortable, and Jack should go. Why are we taking out Red when he's loyal to us? She convinces Felicia, but Sari and Izzy reject the idea. Again, Red is too much of a danger to Jared because of how Jared lied to him. And in the mess, Cam and Bowie end up blindsided by the 8-2 to two vote to send Red out of the game. So it's another bad week. For Bowie. She gets a three in the stock watch. She's been iced out of her original alliance. She's been pushed toward Red and Cam while they're in the midst of being targeted. She dropped Cam immediately in the hopes that she could keep Red around. The second Red and Cam got nominated, she was like, screw Cam. Like She's not a fan of the guy. Um, even though he thinks that she's one of his closest allies, she would have much preferred to work with Red. She had a much better relationship with Red. And so she would hope that she could work with Red moving forward, but that backfired when Cam won the veto, of course. Despite her efforts to try to reconnect with the Bye Bye Bitches when the vote flipped uh, to taking out Red instead of Jag, she was left out of it, giving her a serious reality check on where she stands in the game. Jag gets a one in the stock watch. It's a hard rating to achieve. And he achieved it by just continuing to make the wrong decisions at every possible turn while basically volunteering or being okay with going up on the block while he was the pawn, not even real, or while he was the target, not even realizing that he was the target. And then the only reason he survived again was due to circumstances completely outside of his own control. It was, it was bad. It was bad. Uh, I mean, for the second week in a row, he just, he played with all the tools he needed to succeed and he managed to throw them all away. Once again, saved by some luck completely outside of his control. And he, it, it's, it's just, it, it, it's like he did almost everything he could to get himself evicted. Between the information that he should have, uh, that, that should have been gathered by Jared's mistakes surrounding the power and going back and forth, the fact that he was voted out unanimously, America's continued warnings, Jag only briefly opens his eyes to what's happening before needlessly making a fuss and questioning those in power until he's snowed again into not trusting America and willingly goes on the block when he was actively the target. He gets saved by the grace of Red not wanting, not waiting a day to try to rekindle things with Cam. If Red had waited 24 hours to have that conversation with Jared after he was off the block, Jag is gone. It was frustrating. Uh, I was rooting for the guy. Um, Matt. He's a four this week. Um, we doubted him here. Matt pushed really hard to try to take out America, uh, and it exposed his position a decent amount. It allowed Corey to start gaining some ground back on him in the war for that prime middle position. Uh, America found out that he was pushing for her to go up on the block, which wasn't great for him and his relationships. Um, now, as I said, in hindsight, he did continue to put pressure on America's position with Suri and Jared, which did ultimately lead to the snap the following week. So this rating is probably a little bit lower than it should be, especially considering that his position is still very good. Um, but it 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 did feel it it did not feel intentional at the time. This this putting pressure on America, and I, and I think the the reason why is because he knew that Corey was the bigger threat, but Corey had either disarmed him enough, or he was just so dead set against America enough that he focused all of his attention on America when he should have been undermining Corey. Um, and so I don't think that I can credit Matt for putting this pressure intentionally on this structure. I don't think he realized that was what he was doing. I think he was just more generally trying to take a shot at 
Corey and more specifically America because he knew that they were in a decent spot or at least a spot that he wanted to dislodge. Um, and uh, there, the the unexpected kind of side effect benefit of that was uh, the blow up that then subsequently occurred. So, week six, Cam wins the HOH. Cam only confides in one person this week. Uh, he confides in, in Bowie about what his real plans are. He tells everyone else that he's doing the same thing as last time. He's targeting Jag. Bowie feels very betrayed by Sari for having blindsided her with the vote. And despite Sari's attempts, never trusts her again. And that's important. America tries again to get Jag to do something to save himself this week because everyone thinks that Jag is the target again, that he's going to be evicted again by Cam in the same spot. And she's like, Jag, please, you have to say something to Cam. Cam needs to take a real shot, and I need you to do something other than lay down and die like last time. But all, all Jag really can come up with is a pitch that is so generic that he's like, hey, ah. Uh, what if we work together? And it's it's like marginally better than last time, marginally more effort than last time, but it, it, it's nothing. Cam is so unconvinced by it that he's literally, I mean, going to be a little bit, a little bit cammy here and say, uh, oh, did, did you get it all out, Jag? Okay. I don't care what you have to say, basically. But... Lucky for you, I have a deal for you. And he offers Jag a deal for safety that week if he doesn't go on the block, but he can't tell anybody about it. Jag, of course, agrees. You're going to agree to safety. Cam also, by the way, in a very strange conversation, tricks Blue into thinking that she's going to be going on the block for no particular reason. <laughs> Cam only really gives Matt and Jared a heads up that something big is coming. He tells them that they're the only ones he trusts along with Bowie. And that tracks because they're the only ones he gives a heads up to other than Bowie. So he blindsides most of the house and he nominates Izzy and Felicia. He says, the whole house made me look like a dumbass. Now they all look like dumbasses. With Suri on the defensive, the game starts opening up. Matt and Jag formalize their final two. They call themselves the Minutemen. Um, they then play in the veto competition where uh, Matt wins the competition, but allows Jared to keep the veto. Um, importantly as well, from this veto competition, Sari gets stuck in a punishment with Felicia, the person she's trying to get voted out this week. While this is happening, Cam pitches the next stage of his plan to Jared. It's a Suri backdoor. Jared tries to talk him out of it, instead spilling a ton of information to Cam for no particular reason, including, vitally, that Corey has a non-game-related secret that he told America. He's referring to the Zach brother survivor secret. Why does he say this to Cam? Because he can. Cam also lets Jared know that he made a deal with Jag at the start of the week, which of course immediately spreads to every single person in the house other than Jag as more reason to not trust Jag, including Blue, who is like, I can't believe he's hiding more things from me. This, this Jag is so untrustworthy. Jared, in the meantime, becomes increasingly frustrated with Corey and America because Corey keeps telling America things like his brother's secret, and he told America that Jared was close to Cam, and then America told Cam about it, and then Cam told Jared about it. They also start kissing finally at this time, and it gets out that they are kissing at this time. Again, coincidental timing. He starts ranting about how Corey needs to go next week. The guy is trouble. He needs to go. Izzy doesn't love this. She asks Jared, please just leave me, Corey. I need Corey in the game. You can take out America, but I need Corey. Because Izzy and Corey have gotten closer, and Izzy feels like the, the one piece of self-interested gameplay she can do is to keep Corey around for the end game, or at least closer to it. Jared says, no, both of them need to go. Cam is right. America is the fancy car, and Corey is the brains. He needs to go. 
So Izzy tries warning Corey about Jared in hopes of mending the rift, that if she can warn Corey and give him some advice on how to build that bridge back up, then maybe she can help keep Corey around. So Corey tries talking to Jared about it, but Jared doesn't budge at all. He tells Corey, I'm definitely putting up America on the block next week. I'm definitely putting America on the block next week. Why would you say that to Corey? Because you can, I guess. <clears throat> Matt had heard that America was told that he was campaigning against her a little bit last week. He found out that America found out that he was campaigning against her. And so he goes to talk to her and he works on the relationship. He tells her that he had the power, the path to power. Um, and he also lets her know that Sari knew about it. This is a pretty bold play by Matt um, to really just open up to America and give her some some serious secrets um, in the hopes of repairing that relationship that he had ruined by being a little extra in the in the previous week. But it really pays off. It goes a long way with America, who tells Corey, and Corey realizes I've been an idiot for not believing, for not realizing that uh, that Suri was chosen to play. Plus, the fact that Suri told Matt and not me is confirmation that I am not in the spot that I wanted to be in, and that Matt probably is. So, Jag, Blue, and America the next morning talk about kind of wanting to get rid of Izzy. You know, instead of Felicia. Izzy's kind of the bigger threat here. Uh, but Blue rats this out immediately to Jared, which convinces him further that Jag and America need to be the next people to go. So, he's off the Corey train a bit, but now he's back on Jag and America need to go up next to each other if he wins uh, HOH. And Jag needs to be the target once again. Izzy questions Corey about America trying to take her out because Jared lets Izzy know that America had this conversation and Izzy's hurt. She's like, what the hell? We've been trying to work with America and she's now talking about trying to vote me out. Corey denies knowing anything about it because he didn't really. Um, and Izzy says that she was told by Blue. So Corey goes to America and he says, America, did you talk to Blue about wanting Izzy out? And America's like, yeah. <laughs> okay. Blue ratted you out. It's like, what the? F again? Like, yeah, again, dude. Of course. When are you going to learn? She says, I, I need to warn Jag about Blue. And he's like, don't talk to Jag, please. You need to stop doing this. Meanwhile, Jag is still trying to figure out who was lying to him about the vote when he left. Yes, he's still trying to figure it out. When America warns him against Corey's wishes that uh, that Blue has ratted them out, she says, Jag, we talked about wanting Izzy out, and Blue went and told Jared. He doesn't believe her. He thinks, again, that she's lying to him. And it's clear to America that Jag doesn't believe her. So America, frustrated that Jag is continuing to not believe the truths that she keeps trying to tell him. She goes to Cam instead. And she tells Cam that he's being played. That uh, that Jared is not on his side. That Izzy is not going to leave. Um, and that, you know, he's not even going to get his backdoor plan to work because Jared's not using the veto. He already knew that. But not only that, but Izzy is not going to leave either. Jared is playing you, to which he responds, Wrong. I'm not wrong. Wrong. Cam, Jared is playing you. Wrong. Cam? Wrong. How, however, <laughs> after many of <laughs> the wrongs, Wrong. And multiple people telling him that they don't think Izzy is leaving, he finally sees it. He finally realizes he's been played by Jared. Now, importantly, he has not realized he's being played by Matt as well. Cam asks Corey, hey, have you told America a big secret about your personal life? Corey denies it and immediately realizes, or pretty quickly at least, realizes that Jared has sold him out once again. That Jared told Cam about a secret that he told America. How else would Cam know this information? Obviously, America didn't do this. I mean, America does a lot, but this was clearly Jared. And it really 
solidifies the rift that has been torn into this relationship. It's at this time that Sari is released from her punishment because all of this has been happening while she's been stuck with Felicia. She immediately tries to get to work uh, to get Jared to stop pushing on America on Corey uh, and to make sure that the votes are locked in to keep Izzy. She talks to Corey. She sells him on being an America Corey shipper. She says there's no reason for America to be on the block next week. Don't listen to Jared. It's just enough to keep Corey on board with keeping Izzy this week for now. She manages to salvage the situation for now. Meanwhile, Bowie has been taking advantage of the week to develop more relationships in the house, working more on Corey in America, and starts talking to Matt, as well as trying to push for an Izzy eviction. Now, because she's pushing for an Izzy eviction, Blue rats her out as well to Jared. Um, and then Jared, of course, tells Izzy that, uh, that Bowie is trying to get her voted out. Same process that happened to America. When Izzy confronts Bowie about it, Bowie realizes that there's a dangerous chain of information spreading that's happening from Blue to Jared to Izzy. So she pivots. She talks to Matt and she warns Matt. Jared and Izzy are a lot closer than people think and she really thinks it's a good idea to take Izzy out of the game. Um, this is when she really starts opening up to Matt and developing that relationship. Now, Matt is in an interesting position here. He's comfortable. He doesn't really see the need to take Izzy out yet when he's approached about it. Him and Corey both agree that there's no need. Uh, they're both placated enough by Sari to feel like it's not important to take Izzy out. Now, of course, they don't see how strong a position Sari is in. And from Matt's perspective and from Corey's perspective, it's worth trying to keep around this side of the house uh, because they still don't want to work with Cam or any of that nonsense. And they don't want to piss off Sari and Jared and all of them if they don't have to. Jag, in the meantime, still thinks America is trying to snake him. So he rats her out to Jared. He tells Jared that America is trying to drive wedges and she's telling him that Blue is a rat and, uh, and so on and so forth. Then he goes and talks to Cam. And Cam, who has now had his eyes opened by America, who, you know, he actually believed her, tries to explain to Jag what the situation is. He says, Jag, we have been played by Jared. You can't trust Blue. Izzy and Suri are running this house and Jared is working with them. We need to take out Izzy. Jag, again, doesn't believe him. He goes to Matt and he says, I don't trust Cam. I don't trust America. I think they're lying to me. I think they're trying to drive wedges between people. And we need to stop Bowie or America from, win from, from winning HOH next week. I don't care about anything else. I just want to get to the end with the seven. And I, Taryn Armstrong, am losing my mind watching this man play this game. Because it's frustrating. <laughs> Sari realizes she messed up letting Bowie go. And now things are unraveling, and so she needs some numbers. She goes to Bowie, and she puts on her best Sari mist, apologizing for le leaving Bowie out of the red boat, telling her that she thinks Cam is trying to pull a bunch of guys in to work together. And Bowie kind of pulls her, like, Uno reversal card on Sari. She tells her, I never wanted to work with Cam in the first place. I can't believe he's tricked me, and he wants to work with these men. Now, at the time... Not even the feeders could really tell. I certainly couldn't if Sari had succeeded here or if Bowie was just pretending. Given later events in the season, um, it, it does feel pretty clear in hindsight that Bowie was just pretending to be back on board with Sari, um, which is very important for Bowie's game because it is a huge part of what keeps her off the block in the coming weeks. Now, Cam approaches Matt after having failed to convince Jag with this new Jared information. He can't believe that they trusted Jared. He says, Matt, we trusted Jared this whole time, and he's been working with Sari all along. Matt, of course, pretends to be shocked. Oh, oh my God, we can't trust Jared? What? Cam comes back to this idea of the group he always wanted to make, which was him, Matt, Bowie, Corey, America. Now that he trusts America and Corey a bit again. Matt, though, of course, tells Sari about this. He lets her know, hey, just a heads up, Cam no longer trusts Jared. Uh, and Cam is trying to work with, guess who? Corey in America. This cements Matt with Sari and Izzy again. They talk about how much they love Matt and how they should replace Corey with Matt. 
everything Matt has wanted. America is still trying to push for the Izzy move, though. She organizes a meeting between herself, Corey, Jag, and Matt late at night. They agree they need to work together because if they don't, they'll be taken out of the game. But they come to the conclusion that Izzy should stay. And Cam will go next because he's still a problem. But after that, they will be looking out for each other. Now, Matt loves this. He says to Jag, now we're covered on all sides. This is perfect for us. We can keep Corey and America over here. We can work with Serene and, uh, and Izzy over here. Uh, Cam still thinks I'm with him over here. It's great. This is a great position for us. Jag says, I still don't trust America, though. Matt says, it doesn't matter. We just need to keep playing all sides. So the next day, America tells Cam that she spoke to Jag and Matt. And unfortunately, the flip is not happening. Izzy is going to stay. Cam, who is now listening to America, mostly, refuses to believe that he doesn't have Matt on board. He says, but if we have Matt, we have the votes. Don't we? She says, Matt is the one who was the least on board. And Cam gets frustrated. He's like, no way do I not have Matt. He says, I just want to start blowing things up. And she says, go for it. So he goes downstairs and he tells Felicia, hey, you're being lied to. The plan is to vote you out. You should talk to your people about that. He talks to Matt and he says, Matt, you're not as smart as I think you are. Or, uh, you're not as smart as I think you are if you plan to keep busy. This pisses Matt off. He doesn't like being spoken to like that. But everyone's running around downstairs now because Felicia has heard she's not, she doesn't have the votes. She's questioning Jag. She's questioning everyone. And America thinks it's her fault because she hinted to Mimi this, that morning that the votes might not be there. She confesses to Corey that she told Mimi that the votes might not be there. She thinks it's her fault. Jared, having been told now that Cam was trying to get Jag to not trust him, tries to counter that by telling Jack, Cam that Jag ratted him out. Now, this is a little confusing. So all of this stuff is happening at once. Jared goes to, to Cam, knowing that Cam told Jared he can't trust, or ca that Cam told Jag he can't trust Jared. So Jared goes to Cam and he says, hey, just so you know, Jag came to me and told me about your conversation, about talking about me. Like, I don't know what Jag was talking about with that. He was trying to like prove to Cam that he can't trust Jag, but Cam just turns around and uses this to finally get Jag moving in the right direction. He says, hey, Jag, Jared just told me everything you guys talked about. The fact that you told him everything about our conversation. Why did you do that, first of all? But second, do you see it now? I can't make the blue and you situation any more clear. They are both against you. You're being used. We're not even pawns. We're the board. While that conversation is happening, Izzy is confronting Corey outside of the HOH room about why Felicia is running around asking if she has the votes. Corey admits, he says, well, America said something because he thinks it's America's fault. And Izzy says, well, that is concerning to me. We had a whole plan. I, Corey, I'm almost done trying to advocate for her. You know, I have been. He says, he says, I, I'm not going to defend her. I, 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 I've been dying on that hill. She says, well, don't. You've got to stop it. You have got to be done. I'm so close to putting her up if I win HOH, Corey. Corey's like, oh, God, Jared's going to freak out when he finds out about this. And Izzy's like, well, you're going to have to stop sleeping in the same bed as her to deal with the Jared situation. Izzy leaves, America joins Corey, and that's when Jag comes out of this, his conversation with Cam in the HOH room, having just been finally eyes open about the Jared and Blue situation. Uh, and Corey asks how the conversation went. And Jag says, yeah, Cam was making some sense, actually. Corey says, are, are you considering it? The Izzy thing. Jag says, I, I'm willing to consider it. Corey says, okay, here it is then. Will Matt be on board? America says, we don't need Matt. We have Mimi. Corey says, I know we have Mimi, but there's no shot we're about to do this without Matt on board. He says, Jag, there's a lot I need to tell you. But first, he goes and he pulls Mimi in. He says, Mimi, you've been lied to about the vote. And if you want Felicia to stay, you need to vote with us. She agrees. He pulls Bowie in. He says, Bowie, we're in. Bowie's been pushing for the Izzy vote. So this is an easy one. He talks to Jag. 
about the seven deadly sins and things finally click into place for Jag. He realizes everything that's been going on over the past three weeks, four, almost four weeks. And he's like, oh, that's, oh, this is the piece that I needed. Corey goes and talks to Matt and he tells him, hey, we're voting Izzy out. And he dumps all of the information that he has on Matt. Now, Matt is the most reluctant. He talks to Jag about it. He recognizes that this move shakes up the board and it puts him in some risk. It puts him at some risk uh, when he was in a good, good position. But he also realizes that there's an opportunity here and he ultimately does agree to the move. So the rest of the day flows fairly smoothly until Jag starts worrying about what they're going to say to the other side about the vote. He starts panicking and Matt, Bowie, Corey, and America all have to try to calm him down. And then he goes and he cuddles with Felicia, which, set, which sets off Ceri's radar. She tells Izzy that she's concerned. Why is Jag cuddling with Felicia? They really shouldn't have been pushing America on Corey. I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. I don't like this. Izzy says, <laughs> yeah, about that. I, I did tell Corey today that America needs to go. And Ceri's like, you did. <laughs> oh, no. The next morning, Jared lies to Matt. And he says, Jag told him the vote was flipping. Matt plays this off. Like, oh, I don't know anything about that. But when he talks to Corey about it, they're pissed. They believe it. They think, of course Jag did this. He's such a bad player. They're so mad at him. He was the one freaking out last night. Then he went and cuddled with Felicia. Like, this guy does not know what he's doing. And now he's trying to uh, so blatantly get ahead of us on this. So they think maybe I think we need to, to just go and tell Jared about it ahead of time so that he can't keep beating us to the punch. So Matt ends up telling Felicia about it, trying to get ahead of things. But then Felicia asks Jared about it. Jared questions Matt again, who very importantly blames Corey for it. He says, Corey talked to me about some things. He told me a lot of things. And that's where all this started. So Jared grabs Corey and it blows up into this big argument that if you have watched the season, you're probably pretty well aware of. Um, now, in this argument, Matt stays very quiet for the most part. Um, and Corey takes all the heat here, which is, again is, is very important in terms of how things move forward from here. Ultimately, it's not enough to save Izzy and she gets evicted. So what a week. Bowie got a four on the stock watch, a little bit of a rebound. She does a pretty good job of recovering after being blindsided the week before. Despite having fully supported Red over, over Cam in the previous week, she still has, com has Cam completely convinced that she's his number, number, even though she doesn't really seem to even like him that much. Now, while Cam is making a bunch of noise, she's quietly shoring up relationships with people like Matt, Corey, America, Suri, and even Jared, all while being a voice pushing for the Izzy eviction. Uh, she still has a long way to go before she has a real path to the end, but this is the start of Bowie pretty successfully convincing all sides that she is a number for them. Uh, it's, again, just the problem of perception here. Nobody respects her in the game, which is part of what allows her and opens up these pathways for her to do a lot of what she's doing. Jag gets another one in the stock launch. Now, of course, by the end of the week, things have turned to his favor, but we raided prior to the end of the week. Uh, and, and honestly, once again, it's in spite of his best efforts. At the time of the ratings, Jag had fully fallen back into the Seven Deadly Sins trap again, somehow. Uh, uh, after being targeted by them two weeks in a row. He manages to not believe America while she's telling the truth, while also saying just enough questionable things to Blue to continue to get him in trouble and put him into the number one spot on the hit list over Cam, even as Cam is actively trying to target Sari. They go into the next week, Suri and crew, they're targeting Jag before Cam. This isn't even mentioning the fact that he was basically on the verge of making the exact same mistake that he made on his first eviction prior to learning that Cam had other plans. He's once again given a ton of credible information from various sources and somehow manages to always pick out the lies to believe and the truths to doubt. It's uncanny. He's ultimately a, a force working against the flip that, that makes his whole game all the way up until he finally relents and lets it happen. Like Jag is the thing that's, all, that's kind of like blocking this from happening because he refuses to believe any of the information. It's not until Cam finally unsticks him that 
the gateways open up. Um, and 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 Jag very much had very little to do with the ultimate flip that that again kind of makes his game. And so you know, it's a one. Matt is a five. This is a dangerous inflection point in Matt's game. He's successfully infiltrated Suri's power structure, usurping Corey's position while putting pressure on America. He's continued to maintain his cover with every side of the house, including somehow Cam still all the way up until he has to be explicitly uh, it has to be explicitly spelled out to him that to Cam that Matt is not with him before he finally realizes it. So when presented with the opportunity to flip, Matt briefly hesitates. You know the the flippers aren't willing to do it without his approval. And if he says no, this flip might not go through. Because, you know, they don't want to piss off Matt along with Jared. Like, that's, that's, it's a risky move to begin with. And flipping exposes him, and it risks his very safe position. But he's willing to take the risk. He decides it's worth it. He goes for it. And he throws himself into a spot where he'll have to rebuild and get back into that good position. But... If he's able to successfully do it, that position will be even stronger than it was before. And so we're just not sure if he's capable of it. That brings us into week seven, where, as it happens in Big Brother, Jared manages to win the HOH. There we go. Um, and man, what an upset. His plan coming into the week was going to be that he was going to take that shot at Jag. But the flip changes things. Corey is now against him. And importantly, Matt successfully shifted the blame onto Corey for the flip. So Jared still thinks he has Matt. But if Corey is working with Cam, that means Cam needs to be dealt with before Jag can be dealt with. This is extremely crucial. It's a, it's a crucial point in the game. Matt being able to maintain the relationship that he has built with Jared to, to, to continue to hold Jared, uh, even after having just flipped on him, is the thing that saves, obviously, Matt and very clearly Jag as well, their entire games, forces... Uh, uh, Jared into making a mistake that he comes to regret, which is targeting Cam here instead of making a deal. And um, it's it, it can't be understated how big this is that Matt, and it is Matt, is able to do this. The initial plan is to nominate both Corey and Jag with the intention to backdoor Cam. And if Cam wins the veto, Jag is the backup target. That's the plan. But Matt talks to Jared. And he acts like, oh, Corey got in my head. You know, Corey did all this. And, and it's, oh, man, I just can't believe that this happened. from Corey, I still want to work with you, Jared. And Jared agrees. They can still work together moving forward. Matt says he thinks the noms should be Corey and America for the cam backdoor. And Jared asks Matt. He says, well, is it safe to keep Jag around? Matt says, Jared, you can trust Jag. Jag is mad at Corey in America. He will go after them. Matt is lying. Jared says, you really think I'm safe with him? Matt says, yes, definitely. Jared says, okay. Now, Jared talks to Jag, who has, of course, prepared a whole detailed story about not believing Corey and so on and so forth. Uh, and as he's about to start saying the story, Jared says, ah, look, I don't, I don't want to get into it. All I need to know is, are you still on board with the remaining six from the seven deadly sins? Jag says, I'm on board. And Jared says, okay. The work had already been done. Jared talks to Sari. He says, I, I still don't trust Jag. But I do still think I have Matt. And Sari says, well, if that's the case, if you do have Matt, then maybe keep them, maybe keep Jag off the block. Maybe do what Matt wants. Um, because we know Jag is close to Matt. And so, like, there's at least that connection there. So, that's what Jared does. He locks in Corey and America as his nominees with the intention to take out Cam. Now, Bowie is going to dump some info on Cam uh, to Suri and Jared. 
because she would prefer that Cam leave over Corey. She's worried for Corey's safety here. She has a good relationship with Corey, and she, again, doesn't particularly care for Cam at this point in the game. Blue has her own little saga here. She learns about all the things that Jared and Sari and them were doing and feels very betrayed. She was turned against Jag for no particular reason, and she apologizes to Jag for doubting him. She decides she wants to work with Matt and Jag for real, while also trying to string along Jared. And that's where Blue, that's where Blue's path begins uh, here, or starts uh, moving toward, at least. Jared proposes an alliance with Matt, Suri, and Blue. Those are the only people he cares about in the game at this point after that whole flip. Matt tells Suri, I'm here for you now that Izzy is gone. Sneaky bugger. Matt, Jag, Corey, and America solidify their four, celebrating the vote flip and mourning their inability to seal the deal with the HOH. So Matt and Jag discuss, who do we want to work with long-term? We've got a lot of options here. Matt says, I want to keep playing all sides, but ultimately, I think Suri and Blue should come further than Corey and America. But obviously, Jared has to go first. Jag disagrees. He thinks that they should go to the end with Corey and America. He finally trusts them, and he thinks that they want to go far with them. So it makes sense for them to work with Corey and America. But Matt disagrees, and so does Blue, obviously. So Matt talks to Blue, and they agree. <laughs> Jag just isn't good at playing the middle. So. Matt and Blue are going to continue to play all sides and not tell Jag about it. They'll leave Jag out of it. She tells him that the person she's telling, that he's the person she's telling the most to now because she's not even telling Jared or Suri about any of this. And just like that, Matt has become Blue's closest ally. So after Cam is drawn for the veto, Jared has to figure out who do I put up if Cam wins this thing? If Cam wins and uses it on one of Corey or America, which he planned to do, who do I put up? Bowie is the obvious choice but he refuses to put her on the block. He doesn't want to ruin that relationship. Suri has been working on it and wants to continue to try to lock Bowie in. So he does not want Bowie on the block. So much so that Suri herself offers to go up on the block, but it pretty quickly gets shut down. The obvious option left is to send Jag out, but before they can really talk about it any further, uh, Jag ends up winning the veto and it makes it a moot point. Um, so there you go. Suri finally talks to Bowie, again, continuing to try to lock Bowie in, about the middlemen alliance that did so much damage to Bowie's game. And Bowie truthfully denies its existence and says, if it did exist, nobody ever told me about it. Jag starts pushing the idea to Matt that they should throw the next competition because they're set up really well. Matt disagrees. He says, uh, we need to press our advantage and make sure that Jared leaves. We should not be throwing. Felicia has her own story here. She just got saved by this vote flip. So being you know, fresh off of being betrayed by Sari, she pitches a final four deal with her, Mimi, Corey, and America. Corey and America let Matt and Jag know about it, which prompts them to start working on their own relationships with Felicia and Mimi. Jag tries to get them on board with targeting Sari and Jared, which they were primed to do. They were just betrayed by Sari. But the way that Jag approaches Mimi about it sets her off. She says, I was on board with the plan to take out Sari and Jared. But now it feels like Jag is trying to set us up. And so she decides she wants to try and keep Jared around if they can. Um, even if they have worked against us in the past, we can continue to work with Corey in America too. I just don't trust Jag, she says. Corey is hesitant to solidify anything with them, however. Uh, and he continues to tell Matt and Jag about their dealings, which is Corey's own problem. Felicia and Mimi also work on pulling in Bowie, and they bond over feeling betrayed by Sari. Now, Bowie also more concretely talks about an alliance with Corey in America, but again, Corey is hesitant to name anything or make anything official with her. Why? Because alliances get found out about, I guess. I don't know. Bowie and Matt have also continued to, to get closer over the week, and she also starts talking to Jag this week. Uh, as they bond over feeling betrayed by Suri. And he complains to her that Suri has been bullying him. And she's like, yes, me too. Blue has been trying to push the whole crew toward targeting Suri instead of Jared because she wants to keep Jared around. She tells Matt that only Jag needs to worry about Jared. Matt is good with him. But 
after so after more prodding by Matt, Jag finally agrees to try in the HOH. He's like, dude, Jared's coming for you. Like, you gotta win. And and Jag finally agrees. Matt tells Corey that Blue is trying to protect Jared. She's a problem. They might need to nominate her next to Jared to get the job done properly. And Corey tells the cameras he trusts Matt. How? I don't know. Jared and Suri agree that Jag is their next target. They consider keeping Cam even because they want to weaken Jag. The problem is it's freaking Cam. Uh, Corey tells Bowie that he can tell that she's doing really well in the game because everyone he's talking to keeps saying that they have Bowie in their back pocket and they feel good about Bowie. Uh, obviously not all of them are right, right? Corey's good at picking these things out. People are finally realizing you're valuable in the game, Bowie. So let's talk again at final nine or so to lock something in for the end game. This is a season of disappointing game mode. Why? Why wait until final nine? What are you doing? She just wants to be included. America and Blue make a final two called the Sirens. Uh, and Blue tells America that she's going to have to put Corey up as a pawn next to Bowie because Blue wants to target Bowie. In case I haven't mentioned, Blue hates Bowie. And has wanted her out for a long time. I also don't know why. America, of course, warns Corey that Blue is going to put him on the block. Like, why wouldn't she? Um, of course, uh, the veto is used. Cameron goes up on the block and, and pretty unceremoniously uh, is just evicted. Um, there's not a lot here for Cam um, this week. There, there's, there's very little hope, uh, and he, he just kind of leaves. But we head into a double eviction. Where Corey wins the HOH, he nominates Jared and Blue, and I kid you not, I, I, I'm still in disbelief that this happened. Matt is chosen to play in the veto by Jared. Jared chooses Matt. He trusts Matt that much. He chooses Matt to play in the veto. Matt then beats him in the veto, sealing his fate by choosing to not use the veto, and Jared is evicted. From the game would have been an all-time or double eviction if they hadn't ruined it with zombie week but hey that's next week let's talk about this week bowie gets a five in the stock watch she's really starting to come into her own this week she plays the field well she continues to develop her relationships and starts accumulating a bunch of options for what her path forward in the game might be her biggest issue remains that she again just doesn't have any deep personal connections with anyone She's a solo player, and she's successfully positioned herself as a solid number for a bunch of different groups that finally do see her as valuable, but nobody really values her for herself. Um, and she's having trouble getting any actual respect in the game for her strategy. Only Corey really sees it, and even he underestimates her desire to be included in more strategy talk. Um, you know, it's the kind of thing where it's like, ah, what you're doing is kind of impressive for the expectations we have of you. Jag, in the meantime finally recovers uh, from his series of ones, and he gets a five in the stock watch out of 10 this week. He's finally reaping the serious benefits of the previous week's flip, and he manages to avoid another week of being almost targeted by Matt's social connections and his own comp win. Despite this new position of power, Jag is still struggling. <clears throat> Just like my voice is. In the social and strategic department. Uh... He gains Blue back only to immediately lose her again. He has Corey in America, but they still see Matt as more reliable and trustworthy. They want to eventually take a shot at Jag before they do at Matt. And he also sets off alarm bells with Mimi when he tries to work with her, and he plants himself firmly as the main target for a good portion of the house heading into the double eviction HOH. Matt, on the other hand, gets a seven in the stock watch. He took a gamble riding with the Izzy flip letting go of the safety he'd built to see if he could do something better, and it paid off. In the midst of a chaotic, in the midst of the chaotic restructuring, Matt is really shining here, uh, and he is the highest rated player of the week. He's found himself back in the middle of every single faction in the house, well-trusted and untargeted with a decent amount of influence everywhere he goes. 
This is the week where we discover that Matt is very good at damage control and avoiding blame for things. Despite flipping in the Izzy vote, he completely retains Jared and, and Ceri's trust to the point where he's in a position to make the absolute killer move of being chosen by Jared to play in the double eviction veto, beat him in it, and send him home, which he had planned to do all week long. With Jared's showmance, no less. Without Jared ever realizing. In my opinion, I think this is probably the most impressive week of gameplay by any of the final three, by a large margin. Uh, but some of Matt's other weeks come a little close. We head into week eight, which is zombie week. Let's get through this one. Matt has now betrayed Cam, Jared, Suri, and Blue all in one fell swoop, and he has to deal with the fallout of that. Now, I just said he's pretty good at dealing with damage control, and that plays out here. Jared calls him a snake in, in, in a confrontation, and Suri questions him about his actions. He apologizes, and he tells Suri privately that he didn't want her to go up. He just thought he was protecting her by not using the veto. Um, Suri says in the diary room at this time that Matt could be snaking her, but she believes in him. She just thinks that he is with her. And somehow he gets out of that. Jag also gets some heat for his betrayal, but he clams up in the confrontation and the relationship between him and Suri continues to deteriorate. Blue also confronts the two of them, but she doesn't really have anywhere else to go anyway. And she blames Corey and America more than she does them. She's particularly upset with America for having betrayed their final two. Like, what did you expect America to do? You told her you were targeting your showman's. Jag, Matt, Corey, and America talk about how Mimi showed her hand in the, during the double eviction HOH because it was another knockout competition. And in the knockout competition, Mimi, who was supposed to have flipped with them and be with them to side against Jared, decided to target Corey in the HOH competition. She really showed her hand and, uh, you know, they know where she stands now. So... Cam ends up beating Jared in the first zombie competition, and people start focusing their energy on assuming Cam is the one that will be returning, which ends up being a good bet. Matt talks to him, and they agree that if Cam returns to the game, they should work together. Again, pretty crucial here. Uh, Matt did kind of, you know, he was exposed for having not been fully on board with Cam's plan when Cam was HOH and he wanted to take out Izzy. And yet... Uh, he managed to retain that relationship, do enough damage control to still be the person that Cam felt the most close to. It's Matt that maintains this relationship with Cam, who never had a good relationship with Jag, that allows for what is to come. They talked to Blue about using Cam as a way to deflect Corey in America uh, by working with Cam. And America also tries to work with Cam. She also tries to use her relationship with him to build a connection there. Uh, she says, everyone else wants you right back out of the game. And Cam runs that right back to Matt. He says, America's trying to tell me that other people want me out, but I know you don't want me out. Uh, and Cam proposes a brigade-like alliance with Matt and Jag. We can have Blue as our Brittany. They call it the fugitives. Cam tells Bowie that they're, they, they, they've got to work with Jag and Matt for now, but he'll bring her along wherever he goes. America thinks that she succeeded with Cam, though, and she tells Bowie that they can work with Cam moving forward. Bowie tries warning America that Cam can't be trusted, but America doesn't believe her. And when she talks to Corey, he tells her the same thing. Says, we can't trust Cam. Ja Jared also warns Blue to not trust Jag, Corey, or America, but that she can trust Mac. Corey tells the cameras that he thinks him and America are in a decent spot. Jag is still a big target, but at least he's good at competitions. And Matt is his highest rated player. Corey goes to Matt and Jag and he tells them that they should be talking more with Mimi and Felicia. He advises them on how to approach Mimi and Felicia. He tells them that him and America says like, oh, you should tell Mimi and Felicia that me and America are inseparable and that I'm going to win all these end game comps because they're mental. And, and hey, by the way, have you guys studied? You guys should start studying more. Jag's like, oh, I haven't been studying. Thanks for the tip. Corey's like, great, let's study together. I don't even, okay. I'm calm, I'm calm, it's fine. America tells Blue 
that Corey thinks Mimi is targeting Matt and Jag, which is true. She is targeting Matt and Jag. Why does America need to tell Blue this information? Refer to my previous freakout. Blue, of course, runs this to Matt and Jag, who are pissed that they're hearing this from Blue and not Corey and America themselves. Jag says, I am too trusting. I really thought they were with us. Matt says, America, she's just been looking pretty while we do all the work for her. Jag says, bro, she's a snake. She's a snitch. Blue says, she's not a girl's girl. They should be targeting Corey and America next week. Matt even says she gives off cheating vibes, which is weird. Um, and here comes the move that really defines the rest of the season. Once again, it's Matt. He uses all the dirt they've accumulated on Corey and America, and he goes to Bowie with it. And he flips Bowie against Corey and America. He has a long one-on-one -on -one with her, telling her everything that Corey has been doing. Once he drops that Corey, America, and Blue had a final, uh, final three, which is not even true, she breaks and he says, they were talking about making a final three with me. The relationship that he has developed with Bowie over the course of the last four weeks. I lost track of the numbers. Um, it really pays off here. And, uh, and he is able to flip Bowie against Corey and America fully. She goes to Corey afterward and pretends that she's still with him. And he buys it with no hesitation. Obviously, this is very important. Corey and America, for their part, tag team Matt and Jag to make sure they're still good. And they both agree. Uh, and they do this by saying, like, hey, we're still with you. We want to be working with you just to make sure that we're all still good. Um, Matt and Jag agree that the, the Blue is probably exaggerating a bit when she was talking about Corey and America. They're not as concerned as they were before. But hey, uh, they're still in a good position here. But Corey and America aren't immediately th immediate threats, which is which is good for us. So, um, Sari tries to warn Blue, "You're pushing too hard for Corey to be targeted. You need to stop." But despite her warning, Blue continues to push hard for Corey to be targeted with Matt and Jag, who are more reluctant to agree now. She pushes through anyway. They argue that they should leave Corey in the game so that him and Cam have to battle. But she says, "My biggest threat in this game is Corey, and he needs to go." This backfires, of course. Matt and Jag later agree that Blue is a selfish player. She's trying to push her own agenda on them. But eventually, the week ends, finally. Cam returns to the game, and Jared is officially sent out. So, Bowie, this week, gets another five in the stock watch. She continues to play all angles and keeps her options open. With some good reads and a good ability to get people to trust her when they really shouldn't, uh, she's positioned herself into a very adaptable spot. It's at this point where it starts to feel like Bowie Jane, of all people, may actually get some win equity with a couple of good comp wins or some luck. Like, it's not impossible. It's, again, low expectations, but hey. Jag gets another five. He remains a target for Mimi and Felicia, but his position is rapidly improving with this twist, bringing Cam back into the game and Matt pulling Cam to their side. Additionally, he doesn't quite know it yet, but Matt pulling Bowie to their side was also incredibly massive for them. Matt gets an eight in the stock watch. His, his highest rating so far and definitely a rival uh, week in terms of uh, effectiveness uh, to last week. It's, it's just another excellent week for him. Uh, he does great damage control once again, somehow managing to get all of these people to trust him again after he just burned them multiple times. Um, he was able to pull both Cam and Bowie to his side this week. And listen to this because it's wild. It's Matt's work. He pulls Cam. He pulls Bowie. And those are the only two players outside of him and Jag who are ever going to win another HOH from this point on in the game. That's it. The game is over after he does that. He doesn't know it yet. We don't know it yet. But when Matt pulls Cam and Matt pulls Bowie, the game ended right then and there. Now, he's once again the highest rated player of the week, and he has conc concretely solidified his spot as the front runner in the game with multiple solid paths to the end and a ton of safety with Jag being a massive shield in front of him if a stray comp ever does get won by the wrong person. And with that, we head into week nine, where a newly reinstated Cam wins HOH. 
Cam, Matt, and Jag were the top three in the HOH competition. The fugitives, bro. Let's go. Man, I, I hope the, the slip and slide is next. And then just repeat that conversation about 50 times. Cam wants to target Felicia. He thinks that she'll be a bitter juror. So he wants her off the jury. Uh, this is the final person evicted before the jury starts. Matt and Jag are happy to agree to this plan for now. And they talk about working together with Bowie. Cam tells Bowie that they can only trust each other, Matt and Jag. Corey and America, for their part, would prefer Mimi leave over Felicia, which is a mistake, because Felicia has appeared to be more open to working with them. Which I get because Mimi has given Corey nothing since day four, despite many attempts. Matt tells Blue that Cam has to go. What? Didn't you just pull Cam in? Matt tells Blue Cam has to go. They can't tell Jag yet, but Cam is too good at comps and he'll beat them at the end. Blue agrees. Matt proposes a four of her and Suri with him and Jag. It's the four he's been wanting a little bit. But he's also been a little turned off on Blue. So Cam nominates Mimi and Felicia, uh, with Felicia as his genuine target here. Seemingly, at least. Now, Felicia blames Corey and America for them going up. She thinks that they ratted her out with the Final Four situation, which they did, but that's not the reason she's up. Corey pitches Jag on how it should be the four of them in the Final Four, himself, America, Jag, and Matt. He says that America would love that Final Four because she'll assume that everyone wants to take her to the end, which means she will be loyal to that Final Four. This argument convinces Jag, and he pitches to Matt that they should go to the Final Four with Corey and America, or at least the Final Five with them and Bowie. Matt disagrees. He doesn't think that they need to go yet, but Corey and America do need to go soon. This is when Matt drops the bomb on Jag. I think Cam should be next. Jag disagrees. He says it's too early to take a shot at Cam. He doesn't want to do it. So they leave it at that for now. Cam then wins the veto. Now, here's another series of events. Corey, knowing that he just succeeded at like bolstering his relationship with Jag, he just disarmed Jag. He wants to do the same thing to Blue. He knows Blue is coming for him. Knows that relationship is shot. So there's a long conversation with Blue where he tries to convince Blue to not come after him. It's not effective. He does, however, give her some stock watch ratings. And he gives Matt the highest one. That becomes important later. Now, while this is happening, Cam pulls Matt aside. And he says, look at Corey and Blue. I think Corey is trying to team up with Blue. This is not good for me. He says, I'm thinking, what if I use the veto and I take out Corey this week? Matt is intrigued. He says, hmm, interesting idea. Aren't you worried about America teaming up with Blue if you take out Corey like that? Cam isn't concerned. He thinks that America will come to him if Corey is gone, which is absurd. But hey, Cam believes it. Cam pitches the plan to Blue, who is obviously all about it. Cam pitches it to Bowie, who pushes back. She doesn't think it's a good idea. She thinks this was is a bad move for Cam. Because the reality is, it is. It is a bad move for Cam. I mean, the right move for Cam was to target Jag and Matt. <laughs> but Matt put a stop to that. Cam thinks they should just go for it. He pitches to Jag. Jag pushes back as well. He thinks the move forces them to win out in the competitions from here on out. He doesn't want to have to play that game. So Matt and Jag talk about it separately. Matt says, I think we should do this. I think we should let Cam do this. He asks, why? Matt says, because if Cam does, it's a terrible move for him. If he makes this move, the whole house goes after him next week. Blue is freed up to go after Cam. It's, it's amazing how bad this is for Cam. And I want Cam gone. Jag says, I don't want Cam gone next week. I don't think Cam should go. And I think we should be keeping Corey and America in the game. And they argue about this for a long time. They go back and forth for days, seemingly. It wasn't really days. Over the course of like the next day or two-ish. Eventually, 
Matt says, listen, I'm willing to keep Corey if you are willing to go after Cam next week. <laughs> kind of. Um, and so Jag pushes Cam again to not target Corey. Cam talks to Matt about it. He says, Jag is becoming a problem, dude. And Matt agrees. He says, Jag is protecting Corey too much. But uh, listen, I agree with you. It's a smart move. Cam says, but we can't do it without Jag, right? Or could we? We can just, we just deal with it, right? I mean, we'll have to deal with Jag eventually anyway, you know? Because again, this relationship, this alliance was built on the relationship between Cam and Matt, not Cam and Jag. So Cam goes to Corey um, and, uh, or sorry, in the meantime, Matt fills Suri in on what Cam is thinking. He tells her he's still looking out for her in the game and it's, it's him and her to the end. Yeah, it's those two. So Cam goes to Corey, who finally admits to Cam, this has been a sticking point for Cam, that he is actually targeting Blue. Uh, Cam comes back to Matt and Jag saying, you know what? Uh, we can we can keep Corey now. He's finally being honest with me. But I'm putting a lot of trust in the two of you doing this. And they both they both promise him that they are with him. Um now this whole saga has helped Matt convince Jag that Cam does need to go, especially with the information that Cam is saying that they need to eventually deal with Jag. And so Jag finally gets on board with the idea of targeting Cam next week. It's been days, but Matt has finally done it. Um Cam, in the meantime, tells Corey, hey, just so you know, Blue was pitching for you to be backdoored, but don't worry. Of course, I wasn't going to do that. Corey is, of course, suspicious of this. If Blue was doing that, then Matt and Jag surely would have known about it. They didn't say anything. He confronts Jag about it, and Jag claims that they've been fighting for Corey's life. And Corey and America are like, what? Again, why wouldn't you tell me? Cam eventually chooses not to use the veto, which causes a blow up between Felicia, Corey, and America. Matt is annoyed about this because he already has his own agenda. He wants to flip the vote to keep Felicia, and she just made it harder for him to do that. He discusses with Jag <clears throat> that that's what he wants to do. He wants to keep. Uh, he wants to get rid of Mimi. Jag says they don't. He doesn't think they'll have the votes, and he doesn't think it's worth it to piss off Corey and America. And, and Matt agrees, but they talk to Bowie about it, and she says she'd be down. So they talk to Corey in America, and turns out Corey wants Mimi to go too, even though he just blew up with Felicia. He just keeps trying with Mimi, and she gives him nothing. He pitches that they not only flip the vote, but that they blindside Blue and Sari with the vote. Now, this is, of course, a, a, an attempt by Corey to try to get uh, uh, Blue, uh, Matt and Jag to sort of ruin their relationship with Blue and Sari, but uh, they see right through it. And they refuse to go along with that plan. Um, but if they want to, con if they want to keep Felicia and get rid of Mimi, they need to get Cam on board. So Jag and Bowie work on Cam. Jag tells him that Mimi is more likely to work with Corey in America and put up Cam. And Felicia hates Corey now. So you know, Cam says, "Well, if Felicia is less likely to work with Corey, then we should keep her." But but why is Corey trying to keep her if that's the case? Uh, Jag's like, well, I don't know. He's overplaying. So they invite Corey in and have him convince them to keep Felicia when actually they were all already on board to keep Felicia. They just want to use Corey as the spearhead, uh, spearhead for this for this vote and blame it all on him. Meanwhile, Matt does that work. He spreads it around the house that Corey is flipping the vote. This pisses Blue off because she's been working on Mimi and she really wants Mimi to stay. Mimi starts to get worried and questions Jag like, what's going on? He says, well, we're just going over the pros and cons. So what are the cons? So, well, probably there's some uncertainty about where you stand. What, what kind of uncertainty? It's like, you know, probably like all of the things. Like, this is the first time you talk game to me in 64 days. <laughs> Blue tells Mimi that Corey is doing this. Corey is the one flipping the vote. So Mimi makes up a lie about having a final four with Corey, Bowie, and America. Matt and Jag question Bowie about this. They're like, what's going on with this final four? And Bowie, for the second time in the game, has to say, well, if there was a final four with them, 
I didn't know about it. <laughs> she does warn them that Corey and America have been expressing some doubt about them because of them not telling about the blue situation, trying to get him on the block. Um, and now he's been scapegoated for this vote and he recognizes that. And so he's he's a little worried about that as well. Um, and they've talked to Bowie about it because Corey still trusts Bowie way more than he should. They decide they need to turn on uh, uh, to, to turn Corey's uh, sights to Cam to to get heat off of uh, off of themselves. So uh, Matt tells Corey that uh, like, hey, Cam is uh, he's looking at you, you know, uh, it's 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 not great, not great for you. Um, and uh, that he's pushing your name and that it was Cam that was trying to get you backdoored um, this week. And, and Blue obviously was also in on it, but Cam was on, on it. Matt also starts working on Bowie to try to get her to turn on Cam the next week. So Mimi is evicted, and uh, that is the end of, uh, of week nine. Um, we're, we're getting through this now. Uh, Bowie gets another five in the stock watch. Uh, wow, another five. Her spot is still pretty decent compared to where she was. Uh, she's navigating the game pretty well, but she still has a huge problem with win equity. Uh, she needs something on her resume. Additionally, she seems pretty loyal to Matt, but she'll have to break away eventually if she wants to win the game. Given that she's shown a willingness to turn on people like Cam and Corey, this doesn't seem like it should be a huge concern at, at the moment when, uh, when we were watching. It becomes a concern later. Jag gets a six. He's in the green. His first positive rating all season. His position continues to improve. Now, some of his strategic ideas were a bit off this week. Uh, and he got himself into some trouble pushing too hard for Corey to stay with Cam. However, we're finally starting to see scenarios where Jag is able to be effective. He's building his relationship with Bowie. He manages to be the person that convinces Cam to keep Felicia. Um, and he eventually also was able to get Matt to agree to keeping uh, Corey, sort of in exchange to take out Cam next week, which is kind of the more important thing. But still, he's got some agency now, and he's 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 cooking, you know? He's got something. Matt gets a seven this week. It's another good week for Matt, uh, but more one of maintenance than growth. Uh, he helped Jag get on the right track to target Cam next week, initiated the flip on Mimi, and helped orchestrate their plans to make sure Corey got the blame for everything while also being the one to keep Corey focused on Cam for the time being. So still doing a lot, a lot of good work, still in the best position, um, but uh, none of the like super impressive stuff from the week before. Week 10, <laughs> Bowie wins the HOH. It's a crucial one here. Um, and Everyone has their own agenda for what they want Bowie to do. Matt and Jag want her to nominate Serene Felicia in order to backdoor Cam. Corey and America want her to put Blue and Cam straight up on the block. Blue and Cam want her to target Corey. And Serene and Felicia just want her to target anybody that's not them. And they assume Corey is the most likely alternative. So Matt makes a, a light initial pitch for Bowie to, to, to backdoor Cam, uh, saying, it's, it's not my plan, but others might want it. Uh, where's, where's Jag, by the way? Um, not wanting to take the fall for this, uh, even though it was his idea in the first place. Jag comes in and starts pitching it himself, but Bowie pushes back. She doesn't want to target Cam. She doesn't think that's fair. Bowie. <laughs> so, Serene and Felicia end up going up on the block. That's what she wanted to do. It's what Matt and Jag wanted her to do, and it, it leave, leaves the option open to backdoor Cam if the opportunity presents itself. Importantly, she's never forgotten that Suri is a great liar and she thinks Suri is the most dangerous player in the house. In her perfect world, Suri is the target. Matt, Jag, Corey, and America convene to figure out how to convince Bowie to backdoor Cam. And Corey tells them they can't keep trying to sell her on it as a resume move, uh, even though that should be what she wants to do. She doesn't care about that. They need to convince her that it makes sense for her game. And he gives Matt uh, and Jag some some logic to use about how Cam leaving is good for her game because it puts her in a position where she definitely makes it to the end. 
Um, and it's good logic. It's a good argument. Uh, Jag says we need to convince her that she's being a team player by making this move, which is another good argument for Bowie. She does want to be a team player. So Matt goes in first and he talks to Bowie again and he uses Corey's arguments about positioning moving forward. If Cam leaves, they could be in a really good spot. And Bowie is like, oh, you know what? I, I see what you're saying now. Ah, I just feel really dirty if I made the move, though. It would be easier if I knew he said something about me. Matt says, well, maybe Jag knows some things. <laughs> but it's clear at this point, the tides have turned. This argument was convincing. So Jag joins them and he talks about how they should be team players and that they're a team. He says that they should name their alliance because he's willing to sink with this ship. And they, she's like, we should call ourselves the sinking ships. They get interrupted and they don't return to this until the next day. But again, the conversation with Matt seems to have got her wheels turning. Now, it's by this point that Suri has figured out that Matt and Jag are doing the same thing she was doing at the start of the game. They've got multiple different alliances. They're pinning each other against uh, each other. It's, it's, it's wild. And she starts to warn Felicia and Blue about it. Uh, all while trying to worm her way into their good graces. She's somehow managing to convince them that she's trustworthy again. She wants to get Jag out of the game. That's her primary goal. So, Cam is not picked for the veto, which emboldens America to uh, act annoyed at him, to his face, in front of Jag. Cam questions Jag about it. He goes, why? What was that? Jag's like, I, I don't know. If you know something, you should tell me about it, Jack. I don't know. Jack, something weird is going on. She she only acts that way when she knows something. Which means somebody must be leaking. Because Cam has been pushing the Corey back door. He thinks that America now knows that he's been pushing the Corey back door, and that's why she's mad at him. So I don't I don't think it's the mamas, though, because they don't know enough. And if it's not me, and if it's not you two, it must be Bowie. Jack's like, oh, I, I don't know. Awkward silence, awkward silence. She's so reluctant to go after Corey. What if there's something going on there? Yeah, I don't think so. Awkward silence, awkward silence. Blue comes in. Hey, why is America all hot and heavy? I don't know. When Cam came in here, she just left. Oh, Cam, it's about you? Well, as long as it's not about me, I don't give a f She leaves. Awkward silence. While this is happening, Serene and Felicia are upstairs. They drop some info on Cam. Bowie says, oh, thank you. That's going to make things easier for me. She's already been convinced. Corey also drops some info. He says, oh, thanks. That's good to hear. Um... Then Jag goes upstairs and seals the deal with Cam's weird suspicion of Bowie and how she might be the leak. She says, okay, that's it. I just needed the excuse. I'm down. <laughs> so Jag wins the veto. Uh, and they celebrate Cam's demise. Again. They agree to use the veto on Suri, but Suri offers to have it used on Felicia instead. Uh, they convince Blue to get on board by telling her that Cam has been throwing her under the bus and everyone's on board now. Cam figures out he's been getting screwed uh, or that he is getting screwed and he dumps all of his information on anyone who will listen. He questions Matt about it. Matt says, I I I'm sorry, this came together the night before. Ugh. Don't really know what to do. Uh, Cam's like, you know, I appreciate your honesty, Matt. Matt tells Jag and then Bowie that he wants Corey out next week. That's the plan. Uh, of course, Cam ends up on the block from that veto. But Matt wants Corey out next. Jag disagrees. He would rather Blue go out next. Matt thinks Corey's more dangerous. Bowie agrees with Matt. She thinks Corey to out next is best. Cam's info, of course, doesn't really go anywhere. Corey doesn't believe that Matt and Jag have Bowie over him. Uh, Suri does believe it, of course, but she's already suspected it. She tries to get Blue to see it too, but Blue has a hard time parsing through what's true and what's false. Suri tells her, just listen, no matter what, just act like you don't question them at all. So Suri and Felicia, again, agree that Jag needs to go, but they want to protect Matt. Through this, Suri starts working on Jag even more, saying she wants to work with him. And Jag starts trusting Suri. 
when Cam questions Jag about the move, Jag gives him nothing. Uh, and Cam's like, don't, st don't give me the silent Jag thing. So Jag starts talking in circles about the game, and, and he's like, you're not saying anything right now. Just tell me why you did this. And Jag says, I, I just did. It's like, okay. An indication of Jag's future jury management. Though Cam leaves the game, probably a vote for Jag. Other people don't, maybe, like it quite as much. Now, Bowie has been working on Siri and Felicia all week, and she thinks that they should pull them in for a final five. Uh, Matt and Jag agree that's a good plan. They have some conversations with Felicia and Sari, and, and a loose group is made that uh, nearly derails Felicia from targeting Jag, but by the end of the week, she is back on board to target Jag. Um, and a, a tighter group of Sari, Bowie, Matt, and Jag is made as well, but none of this really matters a whole lot. Sari and Felicia disagree on who they would vote for between Matt and Jag in the final two, which could become important. Felicia thinks Matt has played a better game, but Sari thinks Jag has made more moves. He's been the more visible player, and Matt has done a lot to convince Sari that he is not the devious player that he actually is. Matt and Jag disagree again on who should go between Corey and Blue. Matt still thinks it should be Corey, and Jag still thinks it should be Blue next. America, in the meantime, warns Blue. She says, Blue, Matt and Jag are coming for you. I'm telling you, you've got to watch out. Why does she do this? She just keeps coming back to Blue. Now, Blue doesn't say anything to Matt and Jag uh, on Suri's advice. She doesn't say anything yet. And then Cam is evicted again. So Bowie this week gets a seven in the stock watch. Now, to be clear, the seven was not my doing. Uh, the, the, but this was a good week for Bowie. Uh, her careful position has already put her in a place where she has a good shot at making it to the end, and so her biggest challenge was mustering up some moves for her resume to bolster her win equity. The Cam move does that for her, and, and Cam did seem to respect it, but obviously just a tough road ahead of her. She'll need both Matt and Jag out of the game in order to claim full credit for this move, but it is a step in the right direction. I mean, again, positioning, resume, eh, you can see a world where this starts to come together for Bowie. Is it a seven? I don't think so, but hey. Jag gets a six. This week is one of Jag's finest moments in the game, definitively being a part of convincing Bowie to take a shot at camp. While it was a team effort and Matt is the one that got the ball rolling, it was Jag that honed in on Bowie's team-focused nature and locked her into a threesome with them. Uh, which you know, was good. Despite this, Jag does remain a big target. Corey and America have decided that they do need to take a shot at him. Suri and Felicia are itching to pull the trigger, and even Blue seems to be wavering about it. With only him and Matt competing in the next HOH, he'll be in a rough spot if they don't win, but it was a solid week of gameplay from Jag. Uh, at least, you know, low expectation. Matt gets an eight. He has an, it's another good week. It's uh, so many good weeks for Matt uh, for so long. He convinced uh, Jag to get on board with targeting Cam last week, and he was the first person to get Bowie to budge on targeting him this week. With Cam out of the way, Jag is still a shield in front of him and has tons of good social connections remaining in the house. Matt is in a killer position to win the game, and it will take a decent amount to dislodge him from that position. He's even relatively safe from the backup target on uh, a Jag veto win because Sari and Felicia actively want to keep Matt safe. They would likely or at least possibly target Bowie as the alternative. That said, there are some scenarios where it is possible for him to go home, like an HOH by America and a Jag veto, which is nearly what happens. Um, so it's, it's not like a, a super great position. I think that it's important to note that when I am praising Matt in certain areas, um, it's it's relative to how everyone else is playing. He is not somebody that is um, like in a dominant position that is unassailable. It's not like a Corey, uh, a Corey. It's not like a, a Cody um, or, or anything like that. Uh, but it is uh, the best position in the house. So Week 11, Jag wins the invisible HOH, which is really just an HOH that lets you win twice in a row. 
He immediately tells Matt that he won, and he says he wants Blue gone. He he's ready to win this debate between Matt and himself. Um, you know, Matt has almost always gotten his way in the Matt and Jag relationship. Um, in terms of like where they move, who they align with, who they target. Um, it's usually Matt's idea and Jag agrees, uh, with the exception, uh, to some degree of, um, the, uh, uh, convincing Cam to not back to a quarry. Um, and so now Jag is like, all right, blue is going to go first. That is what I want to do. Matt still wants it to be Corey, but listen, Jag won the HOH. Now, most of the house is immediately able to tell that Jag is the HOH based on how he's acting. He claimed to get nine minutes in the comp and they say he's a bad liar. So they kind of know. He ends up telling Corey, America, and Bowie about it. Uh, he just can't decide if he wants to backdoor or straight nominate uh, Blue. So he proposes to Bowie that she go up as a pawn for him. <laughs> Bowie does not like this. She fights back. She feels hurt. Um, and he continues to push. And she fights back. And he continues to push. And she says, this is silly, Jag. I should not be going on the block on your HOH. And he continues to push. And she says, this is f***ed, Jag. What are you doing? She cries to Matt afterward, who comforts her, telling her, I agree with you. Jag should just draw a line. There's no reason for you to go on the block. It's Corey that ends up convincing Jag to just put Blue straight up on the block and not use pawns. So Jag goes back to Bo and he says, you know what? I've thought about it. And, and you're right. You shouldn't go on the block. Blue and Felicia are then nominated. With Blue as the target. Blue asks Matt if he knows anything about this, and he says, I, I don't know. She tells Sari she thinks Matt doesn't know anything. He believes, she believes her, or she believes him. Felicia asks Jag and Corey straight up, who's the target? In a very fun exchange. Blue finally rats out America. She's on the block, it's time. She rats out America for telling her that Matt and Jag are trying to target her. She tells Matt first, and then she tells Jag. But before we see any real fallout from this, the veto competition happens. And there are two veto winners this week, Jag and Blue. Blue, having won the veto, is going to take herself off the block. And Matt decides it's time to, again, push for what he wanted the whole time, which is Corey going first. But Jag disagrees. He pushes back again. He says, listen, the plan was I put Blue and Felicia on the block. If Blue wins the veto, I want to put... Uh, I, I want to put Sari on the block. I want to send Felicia home. He doesn't want to target Corey or America. Especially now, he's put Blue on the block. He feels even more locked into keeping Corey because Blue will know that they targeted her. She'll be mad. So Matt tries to suggest a way to, to smooth this over, either by hiding the fact that he's HOH, by nominating Matt and then vetoing Matt and then nominating Corey, or some other way. So Jag thinks on this, and he pretty quickly comes around to the idea. He comes back to Matt, and he says, should I just put both of them on the block? And Matt says, that's a great idea, Jag. So they pitch it to Bowie, who agrees with the plan. They tell Sari, who says, oh, I'm so proud of you, Jag. Matt, of course, gets his own conversation with her later. Um, Jag talks to Blue and admits that he was targeting her, but only because Corey and America tricked him into doing it. And now he's putting them on the block. Blue seems sufficiently convinced that her ratting out America is the thing that caused this shift and is excited that Corey and America are going to be targeted. However, she does still talk with Sari throughout the week about needing to play up her loyalty to them and how they will need to be targeted. Specifically, again, Jag. Corey and America also talk about targeting Matt and Jag next week, with Jag, of course, uh, being the target between the two. But there is some disagreement uh, coming up that, um, you know, they're starting to be like, well, should we target Jag or should we target Matt? It's usually leaning toward Jag because he's just the bigger comp threat. Corey says the reason um, he's felt comfortable these last few weeks with Jag and Matt is because of Bowie. <laughs> he knows that Matt and Jag can't do anything without Bowie on board, and Bowie would never be on board. She'd never be okay with it if they tried, and she'd tell them. She'd warn them about it. Corey and America are then double blindsided and put on the block. America's pissed. Literally f off, Jag. This is when uh, the demonization begins. Because it's America's fault that she was betrayed. Corey, though, has his, has his own plan. 
He tries telling Bowie that Matt and Jag are pulling an Izzy. They're not loyal. He puts together a scheme to convince Bowie that Matt and Jag want to cut her. And he tries to get Felicia to help corroborate this story, but Felicia inexplicably refuses and tells Bowie that Corey is lying. Sari is frustrated that Felicia ruined this plan for no reason, and now Bowie is even more locked in with Jag and Matt. Um, and Corey continues his portion of the plan, not knowing it's already been ruined. He gets Bowie crying to Jag and Matt about what he's trying to do, and she eventually is so frustrated with it, she tells him, Corey, it's time to stop. No more campaigning. After a few days, America does finally talk to Jag and manages to convince him that she's willing to work with him again. But they should keep it on the down low. She is, of course, lying. But Jag believes her. Jag tells Matt he thinks he's got America on their side again. But Matt says, uh, I don't trust her. You shouldn't trust her. Corey tells the cameras at this time that Matt is playing the best game in the house and it's not close. He'll vote for Matt in the end. And then Corey's evicted. This week, Bowie... Gets a six. Now, this rating came before the mess that was the second half of the week. She was still riding high from having made a big move. It's, she seemed to be detaching herself from Jag uh, after he wanted to use her as a pawn. It seemed like she was going to be willing to move away from that trio. Things were actually looking up until Corey's scheme to separate her from Matt and Jag backfired and brought her even closer to them. Her reaction to Corey's plan, in my eyes, killed off any kind of win potential or win equity that she had garnered from her move to take out Cam and and then some. Uh, people started seeing her as a Matt and Jag puppet who couldn't handle actually playing the game. This week, in my eyes, was the beginning of the end for Bowie as a social or a strategic player with any kind of agency. Jag gets a five. Uh, another rating pretty heavily influenced by the events at the beginning of the week. Um, I gave him a six this week because of his strong positioning with some points taken away for another extremely sloppy week of gameplay. Uh, he nearly loses Bowie over absolutely nothing, continuing to push her when it was clear she was upset. And it was just a complete lack of social and strategic awareness that nobody with over 70 days of gameplay under their belt should be doing. Additionally, his initial plan for Felicia to be the backup target and, and, and was, was wild. Uh, and the fact that he needed to be pushed by Matt to make the move that was more obviously correct from the start, which was to target Corey, is, again, silly, as Bowie would put it. All that said, once he got there, he handled Blue pretty well, um, and he did manage to reel Bowie back in. He was tricked into believing America, but that did uh, also allow him to somewhat repair that relationship after some abysmal jury management up until that point. The fact that he's allowed to compete in the following HOH is so massive for his game because once again, the whole house is targeting him aside from Matt and Bowie and maybe Blue, but that's up for debate. Matt gets another eight. It's another very strong week of game from Matt. When Jag screws up, Matt cleans up and he takes advantage, comforting Bowie, pushing Jag to go after Corey, maintaining his relationships with Sari, Felicia, and Blue to make sure they all go after Jag and protect him. But he is in an awkward position because with Jag winning so many competitions, he needs to not only have Jag as a shield in front of him, but to also not be the backup target in case Jag wins the veto. He seems pretty close to this with Felicia and Sari talking about actively wanting to keep Matt around and considering Bowie as their backup target. But we never got to see this actually play out. Like, would they have actually targeted Bowie over Matt if, if Jag won a veto? It's hard to believe. It's what, it is what they were saying, but it's, it's one of those things that's like, once you're there, you know, kind of similar to how Jag was saying he wouldn't target Corey, but then when push came to shove, he did. So week 12, Jag wins the HOH again. Sari coming in second place. And this is massive, massively massive for Jag and Matt and Bowie. Uh, this is where we would have found out what happens if Sari wins this HOH because Jag's not allowed to compete. She nominates Jag and maybe Bowie and then Jag wins the veto and Jag takes himself off the block. Does Matt go up? Does Matt go home? Does Bowie go home? I don't know. I would love to have known. It certainly would have put Jag in an even more dire position, but, uh, you know, without, without Bowie around, does he leave at the final six? It's possible, right? Uh, but, you know, it's a lot of what ifs. 
So Matt, Jag, and Bowie all agree that Blue is a bigger threat than America, and she should be the one that's evicted this week. So Jag is going to target Blue again. Um, Bowie proposes that Blue should go straight up on the block against America to ensure that at least one of them leaves, and they both agree with Bowie's plan. Jag is annoyed at Bowie, though, because he blames her for things being so messy last week. If she had just agreed to be a pawn for me, we wouldn't be in this situation right now. He wouldn't have needed to win. I, I was needlessly blaming Bowie here in my eyes. But Blue basically volunteers to be a pawn, happy to be part of sending America home. Uh, Jag lets Serene know the plan to take out Blue, and uh, Blue and America go up on the block. Um, and then, you know, a little, a little bit of a jump there in the graphic, but hey. Matt convinces Blue to choose him for house guest choice. Uh, again. Sari tells Felicia that Blue is probably the target if she's on the block, uh, and Sari encourages Blue to win the veto for herself. Um, during this time, America and Bowie start talking more and bonding more. Uh, Felicia tells Jag that Sari warned Blue and that, sh that she's the target. Felicia ratting out Sari for no discernible reason here. Um, we eventually find out that she thinks that, that you know, Sari is going to get caught. She's trying to get ahead of it. It's a weird thing. But Jag eventually wins the veto. And he's pissed at Sari for betraying their trust again. He can't believe that he trusted her again after everything. Matt tries playing it down. Um, they still have bigger fish to fry. Uh, and Jag tells Bowie about it. He says, at this point, I'd prefer America to be in the end with us. He thinks America is more likely to be loyal. Matt tells Sari that his ideal scenario, getting to the end game, is taking a shot at Jag at the final four. Sari tells Felicia about this. Felicia runs it to Jag, who confronts Matt, who denies it. Matt asks Sari about it, who also denies it. She says, okay, Felicia's been ratting me out. She has some good damage control here, and everyone is convinced that it's all Felicia's fault, planting the target back on America before uh, the two of them. But, oh boy, what a ride that was. Um... Blue still hasn't been told she's going home, but she starts to get, get concerned when she sees Bowie spending a lot of time with America because, again, they've been talking a lot. So she confronts Jag about it. She's worried. Bowie's not talking to me. Jag's like, oh. He's like, have you, have you talked to Sari? Like, nah, no, but I, but I want to. Um, yeah, I'll, ta I'll talk to Felish. Yeah, I'll talk to Sari. Okay. They do eventually end up telling her last minute. And at some point in this process, the feeds are not on, she ends up indicating that she's more mad at Jag than Matt for, for her eviction. And that Matt is playing a better game. Even Corey thought so. Remember when Corey had that long conversation with Blue and she told Blue, or he told Blue that Matt had the highest rating in the stock watch? It came back. I told you it was going to come back. It came back, and now Jag knows that Corey thinks that Matt is playing a better game, that Blue is more mad at Jag than Matt, that she thinks Matt is playing a better game. And all of a sudden, Jag is concerned. But Blue is evicted, and we head into a double eviction, where Bowie manages to win the HOH. She nominates America and Felicia. Matt wins the veto. He doesn't use it, and America is voted out. So, Bowie gets a three in the stock watch. Her very poor week, the prior week, is catching up to her in the ratings, and this double eviction result really seals the deal. I mean, fair or not, she needed to show some independence, and the fact that she had been working on a relationship with America and chose to evict her on her HOA train over other people that she had less of a relationship with likely serves as the final proof that she's not playing a self-interested game when it comes to the jury. But don't worry, there's more proof coming up. Jag gets a six again in the stock watch. Another HOH win, another potential competitor out, followed by his only round of vulnerability since Cam's HOH, and he manages to survive it. It's clear now that Jag's game has relied on comp wins, but it's starting to look like that might be enough to get him to the end. His biggest problem is that Matt seems likely to beat him in the end, and Matt continues to be better positioned than Jag. And since Jag seems to be planning to bring Matt to the final two, that doesn't give Jag a lot of win equity unless he changes his mind soon. Luckily for him, he just found out from Blue that Matt beats him in the end, and 
Jag is at least self-interested, right? Matt gets a seven. There's finally been some tension between him and Jag over Suri, and he nearly gets caught for wanting to target Jag at the final four. He really should have warned Suri not to trust Felicia if he was going to give her such damning information. It's very sloppy gameplay from Matt, not something that I was super used to seeing from him. Ultimately, though, it doesn't seem to have mattered uh, as the whole thing is played off, and Jag doesn't believe that Matt ever meant it. It is, however, starting to become clear to Matt, or, or become clear that Matt is going to have a hard time beating Jag in any competitions, like a lot of these competitions, especially the ones we know are coming up, are in Jag's favor. Which means that Matt's path to the end is likely going to have to rely on that social game, which is obviously a tougher path than if he was able to comp out, which was the easier path. Also, for what it's worth, his plan to cut Jag and bring Sari to the final two with him was kind of ill-advised. Sari is probably the toughest person for him to beat in the in a final two, and if that had been his long-term plan this whole time, then he was maybe walking right into a trap. But he changes his mind after this week, so we'll never really know. We head into week 13, where Matt wins the HOH, and I don't have a graphic for it. Matt wins the HOH at the final five, and although he promised Suri he would never go on the that she would never go on the block if he won an HOH, he pretty quickly decides it's more important to show loyalty to Bowie and Jag, and promises them that they won't touch the block. Suri is upset about this, but Matt promises her that if something happens with the veto, he will take that shot at Jag. He though tells us in the diary room that he no longer is scared of going against Jag in the final two, likely because he heard that people already think he's playing a better game. So his end game strategy has shifted a bit. In some ways, it was bad for him. In some ways, it was good for him. It was good for him in the sense that he learned that he can beat Jag in the end, or that he probably can. He might be able to. It was bad in the sense that Jag is now talking to Bowie about Blue and the information that he got from her before she left. That Corey thinks that Matt is playing a better game and how Matt is going to beat them both in the end. And he ends up proposing a final two with Bowie, which she happily accepts. She hasn't been given a final two and. Ages. They agree that they want to take out Suri this week because she's been performing better in competitions lately and she is the more dangerous player. Jag wins the veto. And after winning, he pitches to Matt that Suri should be the one to go because she's been performing better in the competitions. Matt folds pretty quickly and agrees that it doesn't really matter which one of them goes. He tells us in the diary room that this is not his preferred outcome. But it's more important to him that Jag feels he's 100% loyal so he doesn't think it's worth pushing. An interesting strategy. Sari tells Matt that if she doesn't win, she wants him to win. So just watch out for Jag and Bowie. He says, I know they're getting closer. I see it. This is around the time that Jag comes up with Operation Pressure Cracker to help ensure that Felicia won't win the Final Four HOH. The idea is to make Felicia crack under the pressure, to keep her up all night, to stress her out so much that she's not able to sleep so that she performs poorly in the Final Four HOH quiz. And in doing so, they continue to isolate Felicia and Suri. And when Felicia calls Jag out on it, he denies that that's what they're doing. He acts like uh, Felicia is, you know, being sensitive and that he's not intending to do any of this stuff. Uh, Felicia becomes increasingly upset with Jag and starts saying she want to, she might want to vote Bowie over Jag in the final two if that's his whole plan. Now Jag comes up with another plan to convince Felicia that to throw the final four HOH by lying to her and saying that the final four HOH winner doesn't get to compete in parts of the final three HOH, and she, of course, doesn't buy that, um, but it's just more frustration. Sari says she hopes Matt can stop Jag from winning this thing because they're very frustrated with him. Um, now, Jag continues to bond with Bowie over the course of the week, mostly by trash-talking the others and talking about how they're the only good people this season, and Sari is eventually evicted. Bowie gets another three this week. She now has a locked-in final two, but not one that she's very likely to win. <laughs> She does a marginally better jury management than Jag because he's been just completely tanking it. But, you know, she's more willing to talk with Suri and Felicia on a human level than Jag is. But it, it, it's not, likely not enough to overcome the massive perception gap between the two of them, despite Felicia's threats to vote for her over Jag. Would Felicia really do that? Doesn't seem super likely. Jag gets a seven this week. It's his first and only time having a higher rating than Matt and his first and only time having the highest rating of the week. Uh, and this is the strongest week uh, that Jag has in the game by probably a decent margin. His eyes have been opened by Blue about 
his position in the game when it comes to Matt. And uh, he takes advantage of the fact that Matt isn't sleeping in the same bedroom as him and Bowie. And so he spends long periods of time at night, hours, talking with Bowie, bonding with her, um, essentially like stealing Bowie away from Jack or from Matt. And he uses the information he got from Blue to, to help solidify that final two. Um, he's the first person to offer Bowie a final two since Felicia did way back in week three. And this allows Jag to, to really take Matt, or take her from Matt. And, and for the first time, uh, he's able to, to have some real power in the game separate from Matt. And he uses this number advantage to get what he wants this week, which is Sari out of the game. Um, he has a real path to winning the game now. All he needs to do is win one of the final four HOH comps to be safe and then win the final three HOH and take Bowie to the end. Uh, it still relies on comp wins, but like, you know, he should have a good chance of winning them given the comps we know are coming up. Uh, and it starts to look like Jag is, is the guy here. Matt gets a five. He's been boxed into a corner by Jag. With Jag winning all the competitions, Matt has been forced to put all of his eggs into relying on Jag's loyalty to keep him around, and that's not a good position to be in. This means Matt has to let Jag steal Bowie from him while he watches from the sidelines and let Jag take out Sari on his own HOH. And Matt does it. He sits there and allows it to happen. He sees it, he doesn't like it, but he lets it happen. Why? It's a gamble, right? He's gambling. The gamble is that he's allowing these things to happen, and that will allow him to retain Jag's loyalty in the very likely event that Jag continues to beat him in these endgame comps. Now, I was pretty harsh on Matt this week. I said that it was very vital for him to keep Sari around in order to force Jag to be loyal to him, especially knowing that Jag was flipping on him at the time. However, if I look into the future, knowing what happens at the Final Four, I have rethought my position on this week for Jag for Matt at least slightly. Uh, we've made a lot of comparisons in the end game to the John and Netta situation in Big Brother Canada 2. On that season, Netta was the driver of the strategy and she isolated John by taking out his allies and keeping hers. But in the end game, he just won out in competitions. She wasn't able to get him to leave uh, and her allies left anyway. And she was forced to rely on her lo his loyalty to her and he came to his senses and cut her, mostly because he recognized that she was isolating him in the previous weeks. Now, Matt seems to have taken a different approach. He sees the writing on the wall with the comps, and he's gone all in on retaining Jag's loyalty in the hopes that Jag will make the mistake of bringing him to the end. It, it's a big gamble, but if it pays off, I will have to admit that it was probably the right call. It still just feels so wrong to me, um, but it is one of these like intangible things. Um, Knowing the results, like it, it, inevitably it is the right call if he gets Jag to take him. It's just like knowing how close it came to going wrong. It's like it feels it feels wrong. But I have to respect it if it works. So we head into week 14 where Bowie wins the HOH and we'll just we'll move on to this uh, particular graphic here. Uh, Jag and Bowie come up with this silly scheme to convince Matt that she's choosing her nominations based on who comes closer to the number she's thinking of. And somehow Matt falls for this, despite it being the like simplest trick in the world. Um, she nominates Matt and Felicia, even though the noms don't matter. Jag wins the veto, and he starts indicating to Bowie that he might want to take Matt out. She's a bit reluctant at first, but is ultimately willing to go along with it. Now, Jag tries justifying this, talking about candies, talking about the times that Matt has said his name, but he has no actual good ammunition to use. He goes back and forth, really conflicted about it. He knows the smarter thing to do is to cut Matt, but he doesn't want to use underhanded tactics. It's also important for him to represent his culture well. So the morning of the eviction, he tells Bowie that he has to talk to Matt before he makes his decision. And after talking to Matt, he decides he can't cut him. We don't see this conversation, but after it happens, he he's crying to Matt. He says, I'm, I'm bringing you to day 100. And he tells Bowie, I'm keeping him. And Bowie says, I think that's the right decision. So Jag evicts Felicia. Bowie gets a two this week. I mean, with Felicia gone, Bowie's chances to win are the lowest they've ever been. Her best chance is now to win the final three HOH and cut Matt, hoping that the jury thinks that she did the thing that Jag was unable to do. 
That said, Jag was on a razor's edge when it came to cutting Matt at the final four. She seemingly had a great opportunity to push him over the edge and actually put her fate in her own hands and have a much better shot at making at both making the final two and having a slightly better chance of winning, assuming she would actually been willing to cut Jag for Felicia, which clearly she wouldn't have done. And this is likely her last opportunity to, opportunity to have any agency in the game. And, and she just threw it away. Dumbfounded. Jag gets a five this week because Jag looked $750,000 in the eye and said, no, thank you. At best, he took his odds from near certainty that he would win to close to 50% odds that he would win. And that's only assuming that he comes to his senses and does the right thing at the final three that he refused to do at the final four. Personally, I don't really buy into the idea of Jag playing with honor and integrity when he's lied and backstabbed and trash talked with the worst of them. And when the pressure cracker plan happened, like that was next level. Like this is not honor. This is not integrity. This is not playing well. Honor and integrity is an easy thing to preach when the system is designed for you to succeed by default. That said, I do think it's important to recognize the pressure being put on Jag to represent himself and his culture well. He's the first sick house guest to ever play in the U.S., and, and Jag has talked about what that means to him, what wearing his turban means to him as a symbol uh, and reminder to be a protector. Uh, and we can say all we want about his game, and we can certainly criticize the things that Jag has said and done in the house that have crossed a line. But one thing I do respect about Jag is that part of this decision, at least, comes from a willingness to put it all on the line for the sake of representing himself and his community. And I respect that. The other stuff, not as much. Matt gets a six. His gamble seems to have paid off for now. It was an extremely close call, but Jag's loyalty came through. And it's starting to look like Matt's calculated actions over the previous week might have actually been correct in hindsight. It's still tough to admit, though. Week 15! Matt wins part one of the final three HOH. Jag wins part two of the final three HOH. And that's where we are right now. Jag and Matt hang out. They celebrate. They promise each other they've made the final two together. The hitmen are quivering in their boots. And Jag kind of indicates to Bowie that he might actually be taking Matt now to the final two. And Bowie's not super happy about it. And it's awkward. And Jag has continued to promise Matt that that's what they're doing. They're going to be boys for life. Is he actually going to do that, though? I don't know. We're going to find out. On finale night, which is probably tonight or tomorrow night if you're watching this. <laughs> or maybe you're watching this years after the fact and you already know. Who knows? So that's that's season 25. That is my telling of season 25. Um, again, this is my perspective. This is my analysis. Um, I have no attachment one way or another uh, beyond just how I see the game and, and, I, and I passionately want to convey how I see the game. But let's let's summarize it all. This is the season. This the, the summary of the season. This is how the house, this is the summary for the house. It was a wild season from the jump. Uh, the house quickly divided, mostly based on age, between family style and the professors. While Ceri's secret son, Jared, was a mole on the professor side of things, it's, it's pretty clear to me, at least, that the group was destined for failure anyway, uh, the family style group, uh, as there were multiple leaks and Heisim, then Felicia win the next two HOHs. With the fall of family style, professors started looking inward, cannibalizing themselves. Sneaky players like Corey and Matt climbed the ranks. Sari ran the show with a, a haphazard approach, tossing away allies and picking up new ones with ease. 
When she looked at the chessboard, she'd ignore what the pieces were supposed to do and forced them to move in the ways she wanted them to. She took the split pieces of family style and pitted them against each other, creating the Seven Deadly Sins alliance on one side and the Legend 25 alliance on the other side. Then, for good measure, she created the real, the for real, for real alliance to cover the remaining bases. And just like it, just just when it seemed like there was like this unstoppable force in the house that she was completely unstoppable, despite the messiness, it all caught up to her while she was kayaking with Felicia. Jared pushed Corey too far, and Corey flipped the whole table, chessboard and all. From there, Matt took charge in a dominant position, using his social connections to ice Corey out of the game, pulling both Bowie and Cam to his side and convincing Jag to go with his plans for the endgame. Then, Jag started winning, and he never stopped. The Matt, Jag, Bowie trio won every single HOH in the jury phase of the game after Cam left. It, no, straight up, in the jury phase of the game, Cam was the first juror. They won every single HOH in the jury phase. Not a single other person won. And they just cut down their opposition one by one until it was the three of them left. So the question now is, which one of them played the best game and which one of them will take home the money? Well, this was Bowie's game. She came into the game wanting to be part of a team, wanting to have some fun and lying about her age and profession. Uh, she thought that she had found a team with the Bye Bye Bitches and the Professors, but if she had her way, the Onion group that would have made, you know, that she was in would have made big moves, taken out all the men and gone to the end together. But Bowie was an enigma to both the house guests and the viewers. Uh, she held back so much of herself, lying about her life and struggling to make intimate social bonds, which ironically what seems to be the thing that she wanted to do the most in the game. Her primary goal was to be seen as non-threatening, but have enough clout and social capital in the game to avoid going on the block. She told Red that the biggest problem with the way they're playing the game is that they can easily be used as pawns, and she wants to avoid that by making sure she has enough connections around the house. Which she did fairly well. Her fellow bye-bye bitches began to not include her in all of their discussions because they weren't as close to her, and by the time the Middlemen Alliance rumors started, they were primed to fully drop her from the roster. Unbeknownst to her, she was now a pariah. Just walking into a room was enough to piss people off because she was talk-blocking everywhere she went. Still, she wanted to work on what relationships she had available to her. One was Corey, who was one of the only people to actively try to reach out and make an effort with her. Another was Red, as the other person being iced out of the professors. And eventually, she started talking to Matt, who was always there to make sure that, uh, you know, he had a one-on-ones with her. He was always making sure that he made an active effort to have those one-on-ones with people because he struggled to make, to take part in group conversations. Bowie became increasingly upset by Izzy over the course of the first few weeks of the game, who made, was making her dislike of Bowie more and more uh, clear. But she still trusted Suri as her confidant. Uh, that is until she was blindsided by the red vote. With newly opened eyes, Bowie started talking about how she's now been freed up to work with anyone and actively pitched to try to get people to see her as a number they could pick up, even going as far as having one-on-ones with people during a week she wasn't HOH. And this was very effective, as Corey even pointed out to her that everyone in the house thinks she's a number for them, all the while believing that he was the one that really had her. And this was the peak of her game. She just needed some respect from the jury, and she could be a dark horse candidate for the win. Uh, and that's where the inflection point comes for her game. She wins her first HOH, and because everyone thinks they've pulled her in as a number, they all think that they can influence her to do what they want. She holds her cards, her cards close and is determined to do what she thinks is best for her. Her decision to take a shot at Cam is a risky one. He was loyal to her to a degree, but not super popular with the jury and uh, capable of winning comps. So he was maybe a valuable ally. But on the other hand, he was extremely unreliable, and yet it uh, and there's a good chance that she would never get any credit sitting next to him in the final two. Plus, he wanted her to take a shot at Corey, which would make even less sense during her HOH week. Taking a big shot in the way that she did opened up a path to respect in the game. Um, but at the same time that she opened that door, she turned around and went backwards, diving fully into the team player mentality and never really looking back. From there, it only gets worse. Not taking shots when she could have, not taking advantage of relationships she was building, like with America, all the way down to not trying to convince Jag to cut Matt at the Final Four. Bowie 
played the jury phase of the game like someone resigned to second or third place. And the sad thing is that she actually did have opportunity to change that. Opportunity available to her because of her own solid gameplay in the previous section of the game. But she chose not to believe in her own abilities and left her fate in the hands of two guys who made her feel included in a way that nobody else did in the season. If Bowie wins at this point, it will be almost entirely because Matt or Jag screwed up so badly that she ends up reaping the rewards of their failures. But also perhaps a bit due to the success of her ability to avoid the block, breaking Derek's record for the longest time spent unnominated. If she loses, it'll be because she could never connect with people more deeply than service level while refusing to take the opportunity to seize the game for herself, trapping her powerless in a cage of her own design. Jag came into the season calling himself a secret genius, saying that he wants to play as loyal as possible, but knowing that he'll have to come to terms with the lying and backstabbing that the game requires. Little did he know that his attempt to come to terms with those things could end up defining his whole game. Jag is a man with a plan. Uh, truly a man after my own heart in that regard, because I love a plan. And I really enjoyed watching him try to set up an onion structured alliance like he was following a recipe in a cookbook with no real understanding of how to prepare the dish. It was fascinating. And I, and I love watching him approach the game from that perspective. Uh, I, I really did. I liked the guy so much, especially in the first portion of the game. Uh, he's, he was a really likable guy. He attracted friends and allies to himself with his humor and friendly nature. Um, it was his rigid approach to the game that quickly showed the cracks. Uh, and uh, his Onion Alliance was doomed before it started, with or without Jared's help. And despite attracting solid allies around him, his social game fell off a cliff when he was talking to anybody he wasn't friends with already. This quickly made him a target. But Cam's wild attempt at flipping while protecting Riley at the same time shifted the target and landed them both on the block the following week instead. With Riley targeted, Jag was led around in a circle by Sari and Corey all week while Sari dismantled his alliance and pitted its remnants against each other. Jag remained a top target, but Heisem's HOH left an opening for Corey with the help of America to finally land a shot against Heisem, and Heisem was targeted the following week. In order to placate Jag while he was the backup target for Heisem, Sari facilitated the creation of the Seven Deadly Sins, which, well, let's say it succeeded in placating Jag and then some. After Heisem left, Cam targeted Jag according to Suri's design, and Jag basically just sat there waiting for his end while America screamed in his ear that he's being sacrificed. He's saved by Matt, but goes through almost the exact same process the following week, being saved only again by Red's last-minute attempt at finding the truth about Cam's betrayal, and then again the following week being saved by Cam, finally realizing that he's been played, even though Jag, over the course of these three weeks, still somehow hasn't. This was a frustrating time to be a Jag fan because he seemed like such a great guy, just far too loyal and trusting and just, just really awful at the game. There were glimmers of hope, but uh, they only really ser served to accentuate just how bad it was when he would go back to Suri after those moments and not believe America or Cam or Corey or whoever else was trying to get his head straight. The most notable example of this, of course, is when ja Jared screwed up trying to get some extra credit by telling Jag about Matt's power, but for nearly Three full weeks after that moment, Jag still hadn't fully connected the dots or done anything about it. That is, until Corey finally flipped the table and dumped all of his information on Jag. Jag finally realized what had been going on in the game and accused Suri of bullying him. But he happily went along with the flip on Izzy and entered into a new phase of the game. Using Matt's connections to Cam and Bowie, Jag stayed safe through Cam's HOH and then went on a massive comp run being gently guided by Matt to turn on Cam, then helping flip Bowie on him to seal the deal, then going forward and just systematically eliminating every other person in his way. By the end game, he had so much momentum that he was able to back Matt into a corner by stealing Bowie away from him and forcing Suri out of the game. However, with all that power came some nastiness. His trash talking got worse and worse, and his inability to handle confrontation meant that he was isolating the remaining players and refused to admit he was doing so all while claiming that he was playing a morally superior game. On top of that poor jury management, he continued to be outclassed, both socially and strategically by Matt, for most of the jury phase of the game, leading to many of the players leaving the house saying that Matt was the better player. However, there were a couple of people that saw his more visible gameplay as more impressive, most notably Cam, but he also got a bit of a nod from Suri a couple weeks before she left, despite saying that she wants Matt to win. 
So it's his loyalty, ultimately, that potentially becomes the defining feature of his game because despite a season of being evicted, poor strategic decisions at nearly every turn and a lackluster, at best, social game, Jag's comp wins should still be enough to win the day as long as he's willing to do what needs to be done. So, is he? If Jag loses the game, it will almost certainly be because of his inability to pull the trigger on Matt, either at the final four or the final three, along with his completely unnecessary poor jury management and otherwise poor gameplay across the season. If Jag wins the game, it will be off the strength of his competition wins and his willingness to betray all of his allies to bring Bowie Jane to the final two, or perhaps, perhaps through his more visible game, playing out in front, taking all the heat while Matt pulled the strings and stayed protected. There's no getting around it. From my perspective, again, Jag's game has just been extremely bad at nearly every step of his journey. It's it's not just that he was evicted. It's also that just him being evicted was an, an inevitable side effect of how he was playing the game. It's it's also that he just made so many strategic decisions that, that were poor. Uh, the people he chose to trust, the lies he chose to believe, they were so overwhelmingly often the wrong ones. Jag's success to me is a symptom of the recent shift in competition structure. His win record is very similar to that of Casey, Jackson, Cody, and Michael. And if you're in the jury phase and you happen to be the best at these hybrid comps, you almost certainly will win a huge majority of them. We've seen that play out nearly every single modern season. Uh, and with this season allowing for Jag to play in more competitions than most, he's on the very uh, edge of, of breaking the single season comp record, despite having a similar win percentage uh, as players like Aaron and Pauly. Um, those competitions, they did keep him afloat, though. After the Izzy flip on day 44, Jag was only vulnerable twice, all the way down to the final three. And he was the primary target for almost all of that time. For more than half the game, he was only vulnerable twice, one of which was during a double eviction. It was around 20 minutes long. And he was a, a, a main target for all of that time. But to his credit, he took advantage of the social bonds that Matt helped develop, uh, or that Matt did develop, to help maintain his safety in those rare, rare instances of vulnerability. And he took a path that allowed him to potentially win the game against all odds. For as much uh, issue as I take with some of Jag's behavior over the past few weeks, I don't fault him for being the recipient of what many have come to call a broken format. And despite my heavy criticism, I do love the way that Jag approaches the game. He tries very hard and he thinks very methodically. I very often disagree with his conclusions, but I did always find him fun to watch before the competition dominance kind of dulled things a bit. I I do personally hope he can take some responsibility for some of the things he said in the house and, and grow to represent the season well if he comes away with a win. So let's talk about Matt. First of all, I was extremely disappointed with so many of the comments that Matt has made about various women, uh, including, of course, America, and his willingness to quote the likes of Dan Blazarian and Andrew Tate uh, a 27-year-old man should really know better, and there is no excuse for it. Uh, somehow, though, Matt has avoided this ever becoming an issue in his strategic game, uh, very successfully hiding his feelings towards players like America for all the way until she was evicted. So it's unlikely that this will have any game ramifications. So Matt came into the game wanting to win comps, but lie low socially and avoid burning too many bridges. While he didn't really end up winning as many comps, uh, especially early on, his game was defined by his avoidance-focused gameplay. Avoid blame, avoid being targeted, avoid the block, avoid anyone disliking him. He quickly found very good social footing in the game, landing firmly on the family-style side of things, but he was very well insulated inside of that group while creating enough social bonds outside of it uh, to easily avoid any collateral damage as it collapsed. He was able to convince early HOHs like Heisem, Felicia, and Cameron that not only was he not somebody that they should target, even though they were targeting his allies often, uh, but also that he was somebody that they should work with. 
By the time Corey caught on to the fact that every single person in the game seemed to trust Matt way too much, there was nothing he could do about it other than try to get in with Matt himself, eventually falling victim to the very thing he was trying to warn the others about. Speaking of Corey, Matt was the bane of his existence. Piece by piece, Matt dismantled everything Corey tried to build and was constantly replacing Corey in any hierarchies that he was involved in. There's a reason why Corey said consistently throughout the season that Matt was the best player in the house. Matt's connection to Cam proved immensely valuable during Cam's three HOA trains over the course of the season. First, to keep himself safe as Jag took the hit, then to allow himself to be in a prime position to restructure the game when Izzy left, then one more time to protect both himself and Jack when they really should have been Cam's targets after zombie week. Matt then pushed Jag to do things he didn't want to do, like turn on Cam and Corey while also managing to keep his options open as the game dwindled down. Things, though, started to shift when Jag wouldn't stop winning competitions. He was backed into a corner and forced to place an all-in bet on Jag bringing him to the end and him beating Jag, something that looks like it might just pay off. But how intentional was all of this? At first glance, I feel like it would be easy to mistake Matt's game as just nodding along and agreeing with people. And that's definitely not the extent of it. But it's also hard to say that he was a full-on like mastermind player. Matt was primarily a social player with small goals in front of him that he consistently worked on, getting people to trust him more than anyone else, stay safe, avoid blame, take out his biggest threats, let others take the credit, let others take the risk, if possible. He did make jumps when he needed to. He did make gambles when he needed to. Um, but he didn't seem to have a huge overarching like long-term plan. But this method was very effective for him. He very rarely didn't get his way in, a, in the game while never once being the top target for really anyone. Matt, in many ways, is incredibly impressive. To be the first deaf contestant on the show and to face the many challenges that that comes with in a game where it can put you at a pretty severe disadvantage for a variety of reasons, Matt has not only persevered, but he's excelled. Despite not being able to participate in group conversations, he was dedicated to making sure that he spent time in one-on-ones with everyone in the house and very quickly had convinced nearly every person that he was with, uh, that he was with them and trustworthy, all while secretly being like one of the sneakiest players in the game. I think that Matt's secret weapon is his vulnerability. He's open with his struggles and he's able to connect with people through them. It's genuinely, it was and still is to a degree inspiring to me uh, that that he that he has accomplished as much as he has in this game. There's a lot to admire, I think, about Matt uh, and, and also what he's accomplished outside of the game. Um, you know, unfortunately for me, so much of that is tarnished by his attitude and comments towards women. Uh, now, I do always try to recognize that people have many sides to them. Matt can simultaneously be in impressive, inspiring, and vulnerable while also displaying some seriously misogynistic attitudes that I find to be unacceptable. Um, <clears throat> and that's kind of the case for me. Now, if Matt wins the game due to Jag taking him to the final two, I can't help but think that he's a very impressive player. Not perfect by any means or anywhere close to it, but somebody who is very effective at what they could do and executed very well. He'll be known... Uh, or he he'll 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 win this game because of his impressive social game, strategic maneuvering, and strong emotional bonds that he's formed. Now, if he wins because he wins the final three HOH, and he turns out Jag would have cut him, the same is mostly true, just a little bit less impressive overall. If he loses, it's because he overestimated his own ability to maintain Jag's loyalty, as well as the other house guests' ability to see how good he was. Blue dropping the information on Jag that Matt was playing better than him was a huge blow to Matt's game, and unless he's able to get around it, it might just sink him. And so there you are. The final three in this game. That That's, again, season 25. It's been quite the journey. This podcast has been quite the journey. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, another season down. I, and, and I again, I want to reiterate that like the gameplay analysis portion of this game review is just me doing my best and giving my perspective. I bear no ill will or have any particular affection toward any of these three when it comes to how they played the game. I, I, I take issue with how all three of them have acted on a personal level, uh, particularly at the end of the game. Um, but I 
to the best of my ability, that did not impact how I, I analyzed their games, unless it was relevant. Gameplay, per, gameplay critique on my end is never a personal attack, but I fully understand if it frustrates fans or players. So I'll now open this up to you. How do you feel about the final three and how they played the game? How do you feel about the season? Because for me, despite the frustration of the end game, looking back at the season for this has, has kind of reminded me again why I, I do this. You know, through the ups and downs, the, the good behavior and the bad, <clears throat> there's always just so much to learn and discuss. So many emotions to experience and, and a vast community to experience them with. It's always my hope that every season has the potential to teach us all how to be just a little bit better from the players to the viewers. And I can't wait to do it all again next year. So thank you. And uh, that's what I got. If you listened or watched this whole thing, um, I applaud you. Uh, <laughs> these are always a work of passion for me. Uh, so uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it valuable. Um, as always, you can find me over on Twitch if you want to check out more of my content, me hanging out, doing things, watching shows. Um, you can find me on Instagram, on Twitter, and all those places if you want to do other things over there. And um, that's about what I have for you. So. Thank you all so, so much, sincerely, for joining me on this whole journey through the season and through this game review. And uh, eventually I'll get my voice back. <laughs> but for now, thank you. And I'll see you next time.